Goody. It is uh, 7.33 p.m. on October 3rd, 2023. Uh, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, I'd first like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon um, will be joining us later, hopefully. Um, Benkett Holly. Here. Uh, Dan Riccardelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Good to have all of you with us. Um, appearing on behalf of the town, we have uh, Michael Cunningham from the legal department. Here. Good to have you with us. And Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Okay. Good to have you with us as well. Um, then going down um, the dockets, make sure we have people here. Um, for 32 Appleton Street, is Jenna Francis with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Good to have you. Um, for 5 Mystic Lake Drive, uh, Bob and Essie. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, good to have you with us. And you're here also for 77 Tanager Street, correct? I am. I am, Chris. Perfect. Um, for 212 Pleasant Street, uh, Nellie Aikenhead. See you there. Here. Um, good to have you with us. Uh, for 106 Mount Vernon Street, uh, Carl Tumayan. Present. Good, thank you. Uh, and for 15 Moccasin Path, uh, Scott and Chelsea Bouvier. We're here, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects. Signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda and an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So tonight we have six items on the agenda, um, and I'm going to just briefly, I'm going to take them in a very specific order, and I'm just going to explain what that is now. Um, so first uh, will be 212 Pleasant Street. Um, that is because they are just gonna be continued straight away. Um, then we will take 106 Mount Vernon Street, then 32 Appleton Street, 5 Mystic Lake Drive, 77 Tanager Street, 
15 moccasin path, and then we'll do the administrative items at the end. Um, I anticipate that we will be getting to five Mystic Lake Drive around 9.15. So if you are here for a later hearing, please feel free to step away and check back in at that time. I can provide better time estimates at that time. Um, if you are five Mystic Lake Drive, uh, 7710 or 15 Moccasin Path, I promise we will not start you until after 9.15. Um, so just I just offer that to you now if you wanna step away. Um, and come back in, that is perfectly fine. I don't want to uh, take up everyone's whole night. Thank, Thank you. you for the heads up on that. Absolutely. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to go straight ahead to public hearings. So before opening the public hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves for themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. Any vote taken at this hearing will be preliminary until the written decision is approved by the board at a subsequent meeting. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. Um, so the first item we will take up on is number five on our agenda tonight, docket 3764, 212 Pleasant Street. Uh, this is a continuation of a hearing and uh, the applicant is working on um, obtaining some additional information and trying to address some concerns that were raised um, at a prior hearing. Uh, I was notified that they are requesting some additional time uh, to make that happen. So I appreciate um, Ms. Aikenhead being here uh, tonight. Um, the board is intending to continue until October 24th at 7.30. I just want to confirm that that works for you. That works for us, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, so with that, uh, may I have a motion to continue the special permit hearing for 212 Pleasant Street until October 24th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Do I have a second? Second. That was me, Christian, second. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, Ben. Uh, with that, we'll do a roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Holly? Uh, aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 212 Pleasant Street um, until October 24th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Thank you all for that. Um, that brings us to item number four on our agenda this evening, docket 3765, appeal of the building inspector in regards to decision on 106, um, excuse me, Mount Vernon Street. Um, I would ask that um, the appellant um, please address the board. Um, and I know that there was, a, as a part of the uh, appeal to the board. There was a question about uh, the suitability of some of the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals members. So if you could go ahead and address that first, please. Um, I, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is uh, Carl Tamain. I represent uh, Gail Caucasian, Edwin Schmidt, Scott Tower, and Virginia Tower, the appellants in this matter. Um, I had an opportunity to, opportunity to review the town council's uh, opinion with regard to recusal, um, and we will accept that opinion as written. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, so, if you so with that, um, the uh, basically the the appeal we're going to be hearing in two parts tonight. Uh, the first has to do with the timeliness of the application of the appeal. Um, and we, once that has been discussed, um, we will then um, decide on whether we want to continue on to the merits, um, depending on the, the timeliness question. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, and if you could uh, explain the situation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would like to first state, um, I don't know if the board received a, a memorandum, which I had emailed earlier today. But I, I think there are two preliminary procedural issues. The first is whether or not there was a timely appeal. And the second, assuming that the appeal was not timely filed, whether 
the appellants received had actual notice of the building permit being issued. Um, so with regard to the timeliness of the appeal itself, um, there were a number of questions that we would need answers to in order to basically uh, determine whether or not the appeal was timely filed. Um, we are in receipt of two building permits, building permit number 2023-1162 and building permit number 08299. Um, the, the director of inspectional services, Mr. Ciampa, had indicated um, that the building permit 20231162, which is the building permit that appears on the town website and has a um, has a date of um, July July seventh as the issuing date was in fact not correct that when the permit was uploaded to the town system, the um, date of issue got changed. Um, but I, I need to note that the date of issue on, uh, not only was the date of issue changed uh, on what was uploaded, but the permit number was changed from what the building inspector has indicated was the permit uh, that was originally issued and the font also changed. So my question is, how can those changes occur when a document is scanned for uploading? And are they in fact the same document or are they different permits? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, with us this evening, uh, we do have uh, Michael Champa, who is the uh, Director of Inspectional Services for the Town of Arlington. Um, if uh, I would ask Mr. Champa if he could sort of explain the difference between the, the two issuances of the building permit. Yeah, of course. They are the same permit. One is a digitally created one from the permit system uh, that is uh, created when the permit is scanned into the system. And one is the actual building card that is issued to, um, to the applicant. The... Um, We've just recently gone online, but our prior system uh, defaulted to the date that the permit applications were scanned into the system as the um, as the permit date. So that that's the differences. And the difference in the number is that when the permit is scanned into the system, uh, I'm sorry, when the permit is issued to the applicant, it does not yet have an actual permit number. The permit number that it is given is the invoice number. So that's why in the system, there is a, a different number than on the permit card that the applicant receives. Okay, and the, when the permit is issued, is, is put into the electronic system, um, that's not, it, do, you, do you scan the permit card or is the information re-entered? The, the card itself is not, that's correct. In the old system, the information uh, was entered manually. There was no um, there was no function to it that allowed us to take the building card that we would issue to the applicants and have it be identical in the system. Uh, additionally, the digital permit uh, serves a purpose of uh, being able to input the inspections. We wouldn't be able to do that with just a, with a scanned copy. It's a, it's actually part of the program, or was okay. part of the program when we were using that system. Great, thank you. Um, so the application for um, the appeal of the decision of the building inspector to issue the building permit uh, for 106 uh, Mount Vernon Street, the appeal was filed on August 3rd, uh, which is the reason that there's this question because uh, there's a 30 day period um, in order to file and that this date is between uh, June 6th, which, uh, to, excuse me, June 26th, which I believe was the original date on the written permit, handwritten permit. And then July 7th is the, the one that came out of the electronic system, which would have been, that would have been less than 30 days. So this is the sort of the, the, the crux of the issue here. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if I could ask one, a few additional questions of Director Absolutely, Sam. please. Yeah. So. Director Sample, when when did you have knowledge that the documents that were uploaded to the town website changed the date of issuance? 
we were never asked whether they changed the date of issuance. Well, in in your response to the appellant's appeal, you indicated that the uh, the online system automatically changed the date of issuance to the date it was uploaded. My question to you is, did you have knowledge that that's what occurred when the documents were uploaded prior to your... That's a function of the system. It's a, it defaults to the date that it's scanned in. My question to you is, when did you have knowledge that that's what occurs when it gets scanned in? That the date I was I was never asked that question. Well, if I'm I, not if, asking whether you asked that question. I'm asking, did you have knowledge that that occurs? That's been occurring since the system was created in the early in the nineties. Okay. I would um I would just ask that all questions be addressed through the chair, please. So I guess my question is, at, at what point in time did Director Ciampa know that when permits are scanned into the system, the date of issue changes? I, I believe I, I I think I've answered that question seven times. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Tomei, I, I think what what uh, Ms. Champa has said is that the 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 department has been aware that the date that is registered in the online system is the date that it's entered into the online system, which they know is different than the date that is written on the building card when the permit is form is issued. Thank you. So my next question then, Mr. Chairman, is uh, a two-part question. One, if Mr. Ciampa was aware of the fact that the date gets changed, why did he refer, refer the appellants to the online system? And two, why didn't Mr. Ciampa provide the building permit that was issued as part of the uh, response to the appellant's request for uh, information? So, uh, Mr. Ciampa, um, yeah. I was just going to say, so the second question, the second part of that question, um, my understanding, and I'll ask Mr. Champa to corroborate, is that the, the reason that the written building card uh, with the June date was not in the file was that that was already posted on the job site um, on the date that it was uh, given to the contractor. It was posted on the front door of the property um, as is required. That is so, correct. Uh, um, Yet he was able to get a copy as to incorporate into his denial. Had I been asked by I'm the sorry, appellant when the permit was it, it, on the day that the public records request was filed, if the permit had been issued yet, I would have answered, yes, it has. And I would have provided the date. I was never asked when the permit was issued. So I think it was a lack of communication. And uh, to be quite honest, um, you know, not enough homework on your part that we ended up in this situation. Um, so I would I would ask Mr. Ch um, Mr. Cunningham. I'd just like to, and Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, all all questions and all responses should be directed through the chair directly. Thank you. Um, so the Mr. Tumain, are you aware? of whether anyone went to look at the building card that was posted on the property? I am not aware. OK. Mr. Chairman, which brings us to the second procedural issue. So mm -hmm. this question of whether the, the appeal was timely, and if, in fact, the, the appeal was not timely, then there's a secondary issue of whether or not the appellants had um, uh, adequate notice or actual notice that the permit issued. And that's relevant because to the extent they did not have adequate notice that they would have appeal rights under chapter 48, section seven. And we, uh, the appellants have in fact submitted a uh, request for uh, zoning enforcement <clears throat> under section seven to uh, the director uh, previously. So I think it's worth noting that and it's our contention that the appellants did not have adequate or actual notice that the building permit issued, because all the despite their numerous requests for information concerning uh, when the uh, permit, whether the permit had been issued, uh, 
whether or not the permit had been issued, documents produced uh, concerning the application of the permit, all were uh, non-responsive or contained incorrect information. Um, there is a litany of due diligence that the appellants took in trying to determine uh, whether or not the building permit had in fact issued. And I would like to just go over uh, a, a number of those for the record. Um, at the special permit and variance hearing for docket, the ZBA docket number 3737, the appellants made it known that they intended to, the, to appeal the issuance of the building permit. On June 21st, 2023, the appellant sent an email to the director and David Geldart uh, in the inspectional services department stating that if someone could let them know when a permit issued for the, uh, for the proposed project at 106 Mount Vernon Street, Street, they would appreciate it. <clears throat> They're aware of the fact that the permit date determines the time for filing an appeal. On June 22nd, 2023, the appellants received the only response to the above request sent by Mr. Geldot stating, the permit has not been issued. We are awaiting additional information. When the department advised the appellants that no permit had issued, it is our contention that the department had a duty to inform the appellants when in fact that permit issued. The appellants had the right to expect that the issuance of the permit, upon the issuance of the permit, they would be notified. On June 28, 2023, the appellants noticed the start of excavation work at 106 Mount Vernon Street and visited the department the same day. On June 28, the appellants asked the officials in the department whether the excavation work they observed was allowed. The response was, it was. At no time did the response say that the building permit issue, merely that excavation was being permitted. The excavation activity uh, that the appellants observed is not necessarily evidence of a building permit. Under the state building code, the state building code allows the inspector, building inspector to issue excavation permits and specifically states that the uh, property owner undertaking the excavation does so at their own peril uh, to the extent that the building permit does not get issued. On June 28th, the appellants again requested from the department final plans, permits, et cetera, and when <clears throat> informed a copy of the file from the department would be available the following day when the administrative staff, Kerry, would be back in the office. On June 29th, the appellants again returned to the inspectional services department to pick up the promised documents and the director inexplicably stated he could only provide the requested documents in response to a formal public records request made on the town website. The director further stated that if the appellant submitted such a request, he will copy the entire file and send it to the appellants. Appellants immediately in the inspectional services parking lot sent an email request to James Feeney, then the de deputy town manager, uh, pursuant to the mass public records request law, requesting a copy of the application plans and building permit for current work at 106 Mount Vernon Street. On June 30th, 2023, Mr. Feeney responded that the director would compile responsive records for the appellant. On July 5th, 2023, appellants sent another email to the director asking when appellants would receive the responsive records. On July 6th, the director responded by email stating in full, I have attached the files you requested. The application will be scanned into the system tomorrow. On July 6th, 2023, the director omitted documents in his possession from the documents produced by him contrary to his obligation pursuant to the Mass Public Records Request Law, and his representation to the appellants that he would provide the entire building file. It is significant to note and curious that the supplied documents omitted from the documents request are those documents upon which the appeal is based, namely the different dates found on several purported building permits. The director directed the appellants to the town website to obtain a copy of the building permit upon which the appellants relied in filing their appeal. The documents produced by the director included no building permit and did not include either of the documents the ZBA administrator in an email of August 3rd relied on to assert that the appellant's appeal was, was untimely. Um, those documents were uh, the receipt and the original building permit. On July 7th, the applicants in the uh, the application of building permit were posted with the building permit clearly marked 
um, July 7, 2003 as the date of issue and a different permit number than the permit originally issued on June 26. Appellants having relied on the direct, director's instructions to obtain a copy of the building permit online, <clears throat> further relied on that permit in its date of issue for their appeal. Thereafter, and incomprehensibly, the director stated the preposterous position that the applicant cannot rely on the online records because the online system purportedly changes dates. While the director takes the position that the online system is unreliable as to dates, it provides no explanation of whether the online system is equally unreliable as to permit numbers and the font of the online permit. Appellants did not receive a copy of the alleged building permit issued on June 26 until the director's denial of their appeal. It is important to note that the director clearly had a copy of the permit and application and they were withheld from the appellants. Because the appellants previously informed the director of appellants intention to appeal and request the relevant permit and issue date, it appears that they were withheld in an effort to frustrate the appellants appeal. The appellants had no reason to question the date of issuance on the uh, online permit number 2023-1162 as the date the building permit was issued. By letter to the director yeah. dated August 10th, the appellants requested zoning enforcement under Chapter 48, Section 7. And this is why this chronology is relevant, because to the extent that the board finds that the permit, the appeal of the permit was not timely, there's a question of fact as to whether or not the appellants had actual or adequate notice. And to the extent it was constructive notice, did they diligently pursue information to ascertain the date of issuance? And I would submit that they did. Thank you. Um, let's have a couple of quick questions. Um, so, the you had said that the you had a, there was a request to um, it back at June twenty eighth um, request to to <clears throat> excuse me um, to see the plans. Um, at that time, was the request made to have a copy made that could be taken or was the request just to see the documents? Do you know that? It was a, it was a in-person request at the planning, uh, at the uh, directional inspectional services department um, over the counter that they'd be provided with copies of the file. And they were told that they could come back on June 29th when Kerry was in the office to obtain that. They returned back on June 29th and they were told Sorry, we can't give it to you. Submit a request for information. Okay. Um, on June 26th, the, the date that the excavation began, um, you say that the, the appellants had come down to the inspectional services to ask um, about the excavation. Do you know if they specifically asked if a building permit had been issued? On June 28th, they went down and asked whether the the activity taking place, the excavation was allowed, and they were told it was. Okay, but they didn't ask specifically if a building permit had issued. Not that day. They did ask for it on June 29th. Okay. Um, so June 29th, they asked if the building permit had issued, you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And at that time, had they well, been told well, that a they building asked, permit had issued? For, asked, I'm sorry, Mr. Chim, they asked for a copy that day. Oh, okay. And during this time, do you know if anyone went to see if a building card was posted on the job site? They did not. Okay. Um. And then you had noted that there were documents that were omitted. Um, one you said was the original permit. Um, and you, did were, what were the other documents you, you say were omitted? The receipt, the alleged receipt that was uh, yep. given uh, for the payment of the permit fee. Okay. Um, uh, okay. And then you say you were not provided a copy of the original building card until after August 3rd. Correct. It was provided with the building inspector's denial. Okay. Um, 
So I would ask Mr. Champa, um, when the request was made at the end of at June 29th for the card, did you have a, a copy of the card available in the office or was the only copy on the door of the residence? That's correct. It was that we did not have it in our possession. Okay. Um, and Can I clarify? Uh, what is the usual amount of time it takes to prepare a copy of a file for distribution? Uh, so no files are allowed to be uh, provided without a public records request uh, to begin with. Um, yeah. And it, we were provided with 10 business days <clears throat> to fulfill that request. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I would turn to the board and ask if the board has questions. I've sort of been monopolizing the, the floor here for a bit. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I have a couple of questions for Mr. Champa. So um, in the chronology that's provided by attorney Tomeyan in his uh, brief, um, he lays out the fact that there was an email to inspectional services, I believe, uh, to you and Mr. Geldart saying, let us know when a permit is issued. Um, other than that email on June 21st, were there any other emails to you requesting an update as to whether or not the building permit had been issued? Not that I'm aware of. And then um, Mr. Geldart on the following day, June 22nd, uh, wrote back and said that the permit had not been issued. Are, are you aware of that? Uh, I, I may be, but the permit had not been issued on the 22nd. Okay. And to your knowledge, was there any other email communication, uh, about the permit having been issued or not having been issued to the not, appellants? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And then, um, so just to continue along <clears throat> on the, on the procedure. So, on June 23rd, the building permit was approved, but the card itself wasn't issued until the check had been paid, the fee had been paid. Is that correct? That's correct. And so um, the card itself then was handed to the contractor who then posted it on the job site. And then on the 28th, <clears throat> the appellants came to inspectional services asking whether the excavation was allowed. And do you know who spoke to them at that time? I do not know. Okay. And and in the um in the brief by Mr. Tomeyan, he says that they were informed that the excavation was in fact allowed are you aware of them having questioned on that date whether the permit itself had been issued? I am not. And then on the 29th, uh, they came back and presumably because they were looking for copies of the file. And do you know who spoke to them on that occasion? I actually spoke with them on that occasion. And at that time, did they ask you whether the building permit had been issued? They did not, and I assumed that they already knew because they said they were asking for all of the files for the current work occurring at the at the property. Okay, and at that on that occasion, did they ask to see the file uh, for because the file for the the address? They did not want to see the file. They just wanted a copy. Okay, and. Um... Um, those are my only questions for the moment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Are there uh, other questions from other members of the board? Okay, seeing none. Um, 
Mr. Tamain, did you have anything further in regards to either um, the question about timeliness or the question about adequate notice? I just want to correct the, the record. I believe someone had mentioned that the, the, the uh, appellants had filed their appeal on August 3rd. Actually, the, their appeal was filed on August 1. Okay, August, okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so this is a public hearing, um, and the, the the question before the board is whether the, is, at this point is twofold, is one is whether the application was uh, um, submitted in a timely fashion, and the second question is, uh, was adequate notice provided to the appellant in regards to uh, the, the date of the issuance of the permit. Um, because this is a public hearing, uh, the public is allowed to um, participate and ask questions, um, but only as they relate to the matter at hand. So um, the matter specifically at hand right now is, are those two items and related to the questions that uh, the board has been uh, following? So if there are members of the public who want to um, address those two questions, um, you can raise your hand using the raise hand button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Um, or if you're on phone, you can dial star nine. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to these questions? Um, the one, uh, uh, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Bruce Fitzsimmons. I live at 122 Mount Vernon Street, which is three houses away from the property at 106 Mount Vernon Street. Uh, by way of full disclosure, I'm also an attorney and I've represented uh, the homeowners, Sean and Bailey Snyder, both when they purchased 106 Mount Vernon Street and when they sold their former home at 113 Mount Vernon Street. I've also provided them with legal advice pertaining to tonight's hearing. Um, I've previously submitted uh, written comments to the board, and I will try my best to restrict my uh, comments, oral comments, to only matters not addressed in writing previously. Um, as the chair has recognized that the heart of the hearing tonight is the question of when was the building permit actually issued by the building department. Uh, the appellants wish to keep the focus on this as to when they learned about it, uh, but the uh, statutory provisions in chapter 40a section 7 8 and 15 and the relevant case law clearly says that it is the time that the appeal i'm excuse me the time a permit was issued that starts the clock and the 30-day time period for uh, filing the appeal is strictly enforced if the appeal is not made timely um, that at that point, the board and any court who might hear a subsequent appeal would have um, no subject matter jurisdiction over this matter. Um, with respect to the um, question about the adequacy of notice, uh, the court cases don't give us a, a bright line test as to what would constitute adequate notice. But in the leading case on this matter, which is Connors versus Anino, and which I've cited in my written comments, the Supreme Judicial Court determined that the appellant's uh, receipt of, of actual notice of the issue of, of a permit 10 days after the permit had been issued, and therefore 20 days prior to the expiration of the 30-day appeal period, uh, would be sufficient to qualify as adequate notice. I would submit to the board that in this case, uh, the appellants actually had uh, at least 24 days notice prior to the clock uh, running out on their appeal period because their email to uh, the building inspector and to, um, I believe then the acting town manager on the 29th uh, indicated that they had some knowledge that a building permit had issued. Um, I also want to uh, address uh, comments in Mr. Tumayan's uh, petition uh, that perhaps the permit that was initially issued and given to the Snyders was a building, uh, excuse me, a foundation permit 
uh, or something less than a fill, full building permit. And I think if you turn to the building card, which is uh, at page 13 of the packet, uh, it's very clear on the face of it that uh, it's um, the purpose of the permit was to add an additional dwelling unit to property and decks. There's nothing on the face of this permit that would limit its applicability to excavation work or uh, constructing a foundation. Um, I will accept that the date of issuance, well, I would submit that the date of issuance on the card is June 23rd, uh, but um, with respect to you know starting the clock, um, I think I would uh, defer to um, the building inspector's uh, comment that it began on June 26th when the um, when the permit was paid. Now, I also take note that the fee amount that was charged, which was over seven thousand uh, dollars, would be in excess of what you would typically expect for a foundation permit. So, uh, what the town was charging my clients was the fee for the entire project. Um, I would like to address also uh, briefly uh, the comment in town council's memorandum to the board, um, the, most of which I would agree with, um, but there's one suggestion that uh, the board can entertain hearing uh, the merits of the case uh, without deciding whether or not the appeal is timely. And I apologize if I'm misconstruing uh, uh, town council's point on this, um, but I would lead you back to the Connors decision and state that not only is that time limit for filing an appeal uh, strictly enforced with the 30 days, uh, but the, court, uh, the courts have consistently held that failure to meet that timing uh, deadline uh, deprives the Board of Appeals or any court that might hear this matter of subject matter jurisdiction. So at best, listening to the merits of this case without deciding whether or not the appeal is timely would be an academic exercise. At worst, it could put the, uh, the board in violation of Massachusetts case law. So uh, in conclusion, I would just say that um, th I, there's sufficient evidence here for the board to find uh, that the appellants had received adequate notice uh, that a permit had issued on or about June 23rd or June 26th, whichever date you choose uh, for the issuance of the permit would still be more than 30 days from the initial filing of the notice of appeal on August 1st. So therefore, for those reasons, the board should dismiss the appeal and not hear the uh, arguments as to the merits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Um, I would uh, ask Mr. Cunningham if, he, if he's able to uh, comment on the the point that was that was raised by um, Mr. Fitzsimmons about um, the board and if the board decides that the permit was not that the apple excuse me, that the appeal was not timely, that the board um, should stay away from discussing the merits of the application. The way I read uh, Attorney Himes' opinion is that the board could, if it shows the main, they also address the merits further, but are not so required. I think that's the section um, that council is referring to. I think that uh, the most clean, I, I'm not saying that they would run afoul of the Connors decision, I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily true, and I don't think that Attorney Fitzsimmons said that's certain. However, I do think that if the board determines that the appeal is untimely, the most clean way to deal with this appeal would to uh, make no further inquiry. Great, thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public who wish to um, address this? Um, have a second name. Uh, Francesca Coltrera? Yes. And if you could just give your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Francesca Coltrera. I live on 100 Sitchwood Street in Arlington. And I'm kind of sitting here as a non-lawyer and trying to get my head around the idea that you could, as a citizen of Arlington, 
repeatedly ask, has a permit been issued? And repeatedly ask what's going on and not get a straight answer. And that's really what it seems to come down to from where I'm sitting. In addition to which, the idea that you have 10 business days to um, file something, uh, 10 business days is two weeks. So I'm thinking you're not giving people a lot of time if they're not getting a straight and simple answer on when the permit was filed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just the, 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 the appeal period, it's actually a 30 day appeal period. Um, I believe what Mr. Fitzsimmons had mentioned in the Connors decision was that uh, the town um, giving notice 10 days after the issuance of the permit, uh, which would then reduce the time you had to 20 days that the, in the Connors decision that it was found that those 20 days was still a sufficient period of time to apply. Um, but your, your points are very well taken. Thank you so much. There's a button. Um, are there any other members of the uh, public who wish to address the board? Um, Director Champa? Yes, I, I won't take up much of your time. I, I, I can't, there's not enough hours in the evening for me to correct all of the inaccuracies in the previous statements. But I can say that no one in our office was asked, have has the permit been issued yet after the date of the permit being issued? Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to address this? Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and close for close the public comment period for this hearing. So seeing no one else, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment uh, for this mm -hmm. hearing. Um, mm -hmm. so, I'm, um, this is Paul and Marcy Tannenbaum. I'm trying to put my raised hand, but I'm having trouble uh, oh. getting it notified. So. No, so, so sorry, I didn't recognize that that's what you were trying to do. Um, I'm just, well, I couldn't figure it out. I just have one. <laughs> uh, I have a very short comment. So if you could just uh, name an address of the record, please. 109 Mount Vernon Street, directly across the street from... Thank you so much. Slides. My only comment is anyone who lived in the neighborhood could walk past the house and see the permit posted mm -hmm. on the front door, which is still there, dated, dated 623 on there. And the adjoining neighbors who are making this filing could have done the same thing I did. Look at the front door, you can see the permit, and you would know without having to go see in you or inspectional services officer. I, that's it. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sir. One last, one last call for public comment, Mr. Chair. I, I, um, I also can't find the here. This is uh, Carl Tamayan. I, I, I'll come back to you in just a second. Um, but there's no other members of the public who wish to address. No. Okay. Um, so with that, I will close the public comment period officially. Uh, Mr. Tamayan, you had a question. Well, actually, uh, just a, a, a comment. Um, one, I want to know for the record that uh, the appellants never received a copy of the receipt in showing uh, what the building permit fee was that was paid until after the denial, nor did they receive a copy of the building permit that was issued uh, on the 26th. Um, with that said, I would ask, request that the board, when they do make their findings, that they make the finding relative to whether the appellants received or had uh, actual or adequate notice. Okay, thank you. Um, so as, as Mr. Schmidt had, had said originally, um, there are two, two decisions before the board. One is, um, is, the is the appeal that was received by the board timely, um, which means within 30 days of the issuance of the, app, of the, of the building permit, and then the second question, if that is not, if, if the board finds that that is not the case, um, then was adequate notice provided to the appellant in order for them to uh, file timely 
in a timely fashion. Um, so I'm going to the board. I think it's. Um, I think it's it, it, there's been a you know fair amount of evidence that's pr provided this evening, also documentation that was submitted uh, to the board um, that the building permit was issued on June appears to have been issued on June 23rd um, and not on July 7th, and that the, as the director had said, the July 7th date on the electronic card is as Mr. Tomain had noted has a different font, has a different layout, um, that that information, that the July 7th was the date that that was issued into the electronic system, but that was not the date that the permit was initially issued. Um, the building card that was posted on site is dated June 23rd. Um, and the appellants knew enough that there was construction work going on to, um, to go to the building department. Um, and find and try to get information. Um, they did not check for the building card on the building, um, which, you know, as the as the neighborhood said, that would have sort of answered things right then and there. Um, but I would ask the board if they feel that they are comfortable making a finding that the applicant that the permit was issued on June twenty third, as is dated on the card, and that. The application for uh, the appeal being filed on August first um, would not be timely. I feel comfortable with that decision, making that decision. Okay. Other members of the board. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Riccadelli. I, I agree. I agree with you, Mr. DuPont. I, I I feel comfortable with that. The date, the date that is on the uh picture of the, the front door um seems to solve that for me. Okay, so um I think the board should go on record um in regards to this finding. So um just do a, a vote of the board board on uh, uh, whether they would ap approve of the finding that the permit was issued on June 23rd, uh, 2023, and therefore the, uh, the appeal being submitted on August 1st, 2023 um, is, was not filed in a timely manner. So I will do a quick uh, vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Um, Mr. Chairman, just as a point of order, and perhaps Mr. Cunningham can yes. weigh in, do we need to have a motion uh, for that vote, or is this just a straightforward vote? There should be a motion, Mr. Chairman. I think you've set it out pretty clearly, and I think for the sake of the record, uh, I think this is the direction you were going, but accept a motion um, on the issue of whether the appeal was timely. And it sounds like you're going towards a second motion regarding the actual notice. But yes, I would take I would take two to accept motions, Mr. Chair, and then take votes on those two separate issues. Okay. Then in that case, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Cunningham and Mr. DuPont. Um, may I have a motion in regards to the timeliness of the application? Uh, so moved, Mr. Chairman, and that would be accepting that the uh, building permit itself was issued on June 23rd, um, and that that's the motion. Okay, so um, and may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cadelli. So what's before the board is uh, a motion uh, to find that the building permit for 106 uh, Mount Vernon Street was issued by the Depart by the Inspectoral Services Division on June 6th, 2023. June, uh, June, me, 23rd. June 23rd, June 23rd, 2023. Um, and that the application for um, 
Yeah, so the then the appeal of the decision of the building inspector being filed on August 1st was not filed in a timely fashion. Mr. Chairman, another point um, of order. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, so I think that the motion please. then is going to have to be two parts. So it's going to be, you know, that we're we're moving to uh, vote on whether or not the building permit itself was issued on June 23rd. And okay. then that in addition to that, the August 1st appeal that was filed was not timely. So mm -hmm. that's the motion that I'm presenting. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. So you're saying so the motion that's before the board is only that the board would find that the building permit was issued on June 23rd, 2023. And in addition, that it was not timely appealed by virtue okay. of the appeal having been filed on August 1st. And Mr. Cunningham okay. is Mr. Cunningham is weighing in. And Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Chair, that I believe that would constitute an amended motion uh, where you would need another second on that. Okay. Uh, can I just second it again or do I have to do I have, to have someone else to it? Nope, that's fine. Okay, second. All right. I'm 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 gonna write this out so you've got this. <laughs> All right. Um, so the board finds that building permit for 106 Mount Vernon Street was issued on June 23rd, 2023. And the application, uh, or sorry, it's not application, the appeal of the decision to issue the permit on August 1st, 2023 is not timely. Okay, so the motion both then, Mr. Dupont, I would just ask you to confirm. So the motion is the board finds that the building permit for 106 Mount Vernon Street was issued on June 23rd, 2023, and the appeal of the decision to issue the permit on August 1st, 2023 was not timely. That is your motion? Correct. Thank you very much. And that was seconded by Mr. Cadelli. Okay, then a vote of the board um, on that motion. Mr. Dupont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Um, Mr. Hulley? Aye. And um, Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, so that is the the finding of the board on the first question, which moves us to the second question, um, question of adequate notice. Um, is there further discussion from the board on the question of whether the the notice provided um, the applicant was time was uh, excuse me not timely but was. Um, uh, Sufficient. sufficiently made available? Mr. DuPont? So the way I look at this, I mean, there was the request in by email to inspectional services by the appellants on June 21st. Let us know when the permit's issued. We're aware that the permit date determines the period for filing an appeal. So as of that very date, they had complete knowledge that they had to be diligent in terms of keeping an eye on whether or not the permit was issued. And when Mr. Geldart, the following day, June 22nd, replied, it has not yet been issued, Mr. Tumayan contends that that somehow created an affirmative obligation on the part of the town 
to provide updates. And I do not accept to that. I just think that the town offices are too busy to be accepting that sort of responsibility. I think that the parties who have a vested interest in this, namely the appellants, are the ones who have to exercise due diligence. So with that said, they knew that the issue in state was critical. They knew on the 21st to ask if it was issued. They knew that work was allowed on the on June 28th. Uh, they didn't on that date ask if the building permit had been issued and had they, they would have been told it had. Um, they didn't ask, apparently, to look at the file on June 28th either, because if they had, I think that would have been in Mr. Tumayan's pleadings. On June 29th, when they went back and they spoke to Mr. Champa, they didn't then ask whether the building permit had been issued, nor did they ask whether they could look at the file. So... You know, I believe that they had ample opportunity to protect their own rights uh, by just asking the simple question, has the building permit been issued to the people who would have the answer? And I'm confident that if if it had been asked, they would have been told yes. They apparently didn't look at the building card either, which was at least on the building as of June 28th, the date that they observed the excavation work being done. So I believe that all of this other discussion about July 7th and the uploading and all of that is irrelevant. That's just a function of the way that data is transferred onto the system. The real issue from my perspective is what did they know or what should they have known? And they certainly knew that the work was being done and they went to inspectional services and they just failed to ask the right question. But that's not on anyone else but them. That's a matter of due diligence. So I think that, um, you know, the issues too about when they received the file are also irrelevant because of the fact that by that time, they should have already known that the permit had been issued. Their knowledge of the permit being issued is not, in my view, dependent upon when they received uh, copies, because that information was all there for them to uncover. So for those reasons, I believe that the notice that they received or could have obtained themselves was in fact, sufficient. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Excuse me. Um, are there questions uh, or comments from the board? I do not see further questions or comments from the board. Um, With that in mind, then, Mr. Dupont, I would turn to you again for a um, a motion um, in regards to a finding in regards to adequate notice. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that the board find that the notice provided to or available to the appellants as to the issuance date of the building permit was sufficient and adequate. So um, move the board, find notice provided to appellants regarding date and issue issuance of the permit was adequate and sufficient. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. So uh, there's a motion for Mr. DuPont. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Um, 
So with that, we have a motion. Um, it has been seconded. The motion before the board is that the board finds the notice provided to the appellants regarding the issuance, regarding the date of the issuance of the permit was adequate and sufficient. Uh, that was by Mr. DuPont, seconded by Mr. LeBlanc. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, are there any questions from the board about what the um, what the motion is? Seeing none, I will go ahead and do a vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Um, Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Uh, Mr. Blank. Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. Uh, um, so the board has found that uh, the permit, that the application, excuse me, the appeal of the issuance of the building permit was not filed um, in a timely fashion, and the board finds that adequate notice was provided uh, to the applicant, uh, to the excuse me, to the appellant, in order to have uh, filed on time. Um, so that then brings us uh, to the last remaining question, which is the question of um, speak further about the merits of this case. Um, and I, I think it has been. Uh, expressed by Mr. Cunningham um, and from uh, Attorney Heim uh, Town Council. This is something the board could do if it wants, but is not something that uh, we're obliged to do. Um, and certainly it is something that um, would not really serve uh, the board to do. Um, is there any desire among the board to discuss uh, this matter further? Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Um, I believe for the reasons that are up, were outlined by Mr. Cunningham and then also by Mr. Fitzsimmons that there is uh, no reason for us to discuss the merits of the case. So I okay. would decline to hear those. Mr. Is there anyone Chair? Can... Yes, Ms. Hoffman. No, I, I would agree with that as well. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, that being the case, um, unless there's, I think the board will uh, find this matter closed and we will move on to uh, the next item on our agenda. Mr. Cunningham, does that sound correct? It does, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So thank you all very much. Uh, Good night. Thank you so much for appearing. Um, the board has closed the uh, public hearing on 106 uh, Mount Vernon Street. It closed. Um, and with that, we will move to the next item we've taken up this evening, uh, which is 32 uh, Appleton Street. Um, and uh, so I would ask Ms. Francis uh, if she's here. There she is. Um, yep, I'm here. <laughs> so wonderful, good to have you. Uh, so this is a continuation of a hearing that we started uh, at our last session, and at that time, um, Ms. Francis had had introduced that she was looking to uh, open a massage business in her place of residence on Appleton Street, um, and there was a question from the board because this would be considered a home occupation. There are certain categories of home occupation that are allowed. And the question of was massage therapy considered to fall within those allowed categories? Um, and so we continued the hearing so that we could um, discuss this further uh, with the town. Uh, we spoke with Director Champa about this, this question uh, as to whether it is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a, uh, a public service, it's not public service is not the correct term. Um, go ahead and bring up the, the zoning bylaw. Um, 
bear with me a second. Home occupation. Home occupation. Um, so home occupation. Oh, this is in the definition section. Right, so home occupation, uh, it says, shall not include personal service establishment uses. And so there's a question about whether a massage was considered a personal service. Um, so this, there are, there are, um, massage businesses currently in town that are considered a personal service. Um, these are sort of a more general uh, massage services. Um, Ms. Francis presented uh, evidence to the building inspector and to the board uh, that's now in the record um, that the service she provides is as uh, she has advanced training on the medical side of uh, of massage and it's a it's more medically therapeutic than uh, just sort of a, a, a general service. Um, and for that reason, um, it was considered that it was actually, um, uh, would fall under the category of a medical or clinical office, which is a building or portion of a building containing offices or facilities providing medical, then, psychiatric or related health care services for outpatient only. Um, and it was found that that Mr. Uh, the director Shampa found that that was the category that this fit within. Um, so I would just uh, briefly ask Ms. Francis if she could just describe a little bit about what she's planning to uh, what her business would be like um, on this site and then uh, we can go forward from there. Um, hello again, Jenna Francis with um, hopefully soon to be opened Arlington Heights Massage Therapy. Um, and so I will have um, a therapeutic practice here in my home if granted permission, um, seeing just with just myself working here. So it would be one client at a time in my home. I see a lot of um, previously I had a, a, a license to practice out of my home in another town and I have a lot of clients with that are either recovering from or preparing for knee surgeries, back surgeries, pre and postnatal, um, various nerve disorders, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Parkinson's, um, frozen shoulder. I, lately, I've been getting a lot of frozen shoulder clients for some reason. <laughs> um, and so that is the nature of my practice. And um, I think it will be a great benefit to the community where I live if I'm granted permission. Thank you. Um, and I believe you had said before there was a question um, about parking and you had indicated that there was, um, you would be seeing one person at a time and that there was space in your driveway for them to be parking? Correct. We have a, we have a two car garage and then space for two more cars tandem right behind that and then a long driveway. So there's no reason why, why it should cause any parking issues just okay. with seeing one client at a time yeah great thank you very much um are there questions from the board in regards to um this request i just remind the board that this is before the board uh, because a special permit is required for um, a home occupation uh, where people are seen in the home I see no questions from the board. Um, where this is a public hearing, I will go ahead and open this for public comment. Um, so if there are members of the public who wish to address this application, um, you can use the raise hand button in the reactions tab on the Zoom application. Or if you're on the phone, you can dial star nine or you can wave frantically in your window. Um, I do not see anyone wishing to address this application. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and close the public comment for this hearing. 
Um, so again, this is a, excuse me, an application before the board in regards to uh, wanting to uh, start a home occupation in uh, the R1 district. Um, the uh, memorandum that was issued by the Director of Inspectional Services back on August 28th noted um, the applicant consulted inspectional services regarding operating a home business in an R2 residential, excuse me, it's an R2 district, bigger burden, R2 residential district that would allow customers to be served in the home per the town of Arlington zoning bylaw section 543, use regulations for residential districts, home occupation. Uh, there's a note that it requires a special permit if home occupation serves customers or pupils on the premises. Um, that is the request. So uh, when the board is considering a special permit, uh, there are the seven, seven questions um, that the board needs to review, the, the seven required findings. Um, so the first is whether the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district, uh, which we have uh, just reviewed that it is. Um, why the requested use would be essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, this is a, a service that would uh, be very useful uh, to residents of, of Arlington who have um, you know, some, some limited physical issues that they are looking um, uh, for treatment that they would be able to find this locally and not have to uh, travel outside the, the area to find. Um, the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, this would be one car, uh, one patient at a time, as the uh, as the applicant stated. Um, the I would note it was the letter that the board had received was specifically about uh, parking on uh, around the corner on Avon Place, uh, where there is both there's the Audison Middle School at the end of the street, um, and the Arlington Heights Nursery School is located near there. Um, the applicant has indicated there's sufficient uh, parking in her driveway so that uh, anyone who is visiting this this uh, service would not need to turn that corner. Um, it would not impair the safety of, of any of the students who would be attending um, either of those institutions. Um, that the requested use will not overload any public system. Um, no public system would really be impacted. Uh, requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, this is a, a fairly uh, a simple uh, and straightforward uh, request for a, for a one-on-one -on -one service. Um, so I don't think that that would be a question. Uh, the requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. Um, I think it would just it would be the opposite that it is providing a health service uh, to uh, the neighbors and to the town. And the requested use will not cause uh, an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood and uh, it would not do that either um so those are the findings the board um would need to make in its vote um the when the board makes a special should the board vote uh to approve the special permit there are three standard um uh conditions that the board would apply. Um, I'll go ahead and read into the record. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, in this case, the, there is just there, there is a hand sketch uh, submitted to the board. Um, ask the board if they feels that we should impose this condition because it really doesn't seem like it's appropriate for this. No. Then we'll leave it in. Uh, number two, building inspector is hereby notified is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he determines violations are present. Building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts General Laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action, also in accordance with section 3.1. 
And number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, does the board feel that there are any additional conditions which would be required um, should, should this application be approved? I see none. Um, in which case, uh, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, this is this. It, it's a pleasure to take part in the case for once, and uh, I move that the application be approved, subject to the three conditions that the chair read into the record. Second. Thank you very much. So it's a motion to approve. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, second with the uh, three conditions seconded by Mr. Dupont. Are there any questions from the board about what the vote is? Mr. Chair. Mr. Rickard I, I wasn't uh I wasn't present for the first round of this uh conversation. Okay. Am I still eligible to, eligible to vote on this or do, should I? Should I sit it out? You are not. Okay. You are not. But thank you for reminding me of that. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll just add that I wasn't at the initial meeting as well. So I'm in the same campus, Dan. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, we have uh, five voting members. Um, so the vote of the board, uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So, uh, the special permit application for 32 Appleton Street is approved. So thank you very much. Good luck with your business. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Have a great night. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Okay, so I was. I had told people at the start of the meeting they could come back at 9.15, and it is 8.55. Um, I am here, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, I'm just concerned that if there were people who wish to address it, who may have may not be available at the, at the moment, is my larger concern. Mm. Um, Understood. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, we, I don't think that this will take 20 minutes, but we might want to get out of the way the uh, pending case, the approval of the outstanding of the uh, decisions that are oh, thank you. available for tonight. I will speak slowly. Hey. So <laughs> will I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then... Going back to our agenda, uh, this is item number two on our agenda, which is the uh, approval of the decision for docket number 3762, 148 Mount Vernon Street. So this was a case that was heard at our previous meeting in August. Um, the decision was written up by Mr. Hanlon and distributed to the board for comment. Um, and then a final issuance uh, was made this afternoon. Are there any additional uh, edits or comments in regards to the written decision for 148 Mount Vernon Street? Seeing none, um, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the written decision for 148 Mount Vernon Street. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the board approve the the uh, decision, uh, the draft decision for uh, 148 Mount Vernon Street. All right. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a roll call vote of the board to approve the written decision for 148 Mount Vernon Street. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. 
And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That brings us to item three on our agenda, the approval of the decision docket number 3763, 56 Newcomb Street. Um, this was again heard by the board at its August hearing. Um, and the Mr. Hanlon wrote the decision and distributed that uh, this past weekend for comment. And the final version was posted back to the board this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the decision for 56 Newcomb Street? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the decision for 56 Newcomb Street be approved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. It's a vote of the board to approve the written decision for 56 Newcomb Street. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That written decision is approved. Um, so that brings us back. So the next item we will take up will be um, the continued hearing for three seven uh, for uh, uh, it took us five minutes. Oh. Um, all right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, while we have a little bit of time, I wanted to tell you that years ago, uh, my law firm was involved in the first major trial of a Superfund case, and it, this occurred in Denver. And in order to, in order to make everybody relaxed, the uh, judge required all of the lawyers at the beginning of every hearing to tell a joke. And this was intended to have <laughs> beneficial act. Is this a practice that you, you think we ought good. to observe? Um, no, the result of that was we had an infinite number of associates out researching jokes because it was the lawyers were so competitive that they had to have feel that they had told the best joke. And if you know lawyers, you know that even the best joke suffers somewhat at the a lawyer's hands. Um, however, having having come down on the side other than jokes, I will point out that I've managed to take another two minutes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. I would just like to offer a, a comment on the uh, statements that Mr. Hanlon just made. I noticed that he doesn't seem to suffer from the uh, lawyer mangling of jokes problem himself. <laughs> I retired. The, ah, that's it. <laughs> Retirement <laughs> does wonders for the human. Yes. It does at that. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I apologize to everyone. We, Since I did state at the start that we would not convene on the next one until 9.15, we do have to wait now until 9.15. So, um, we will Sort of sit here until that time, unfortunately. But I can with the board. Um, so the next meeting after this meeting that the board has on, on its agenda is uh, Tuesday, October 24th. Um, there are three items on that agenda. There are two um, previous. Uh, two previously submitted uh, new cases. Um, and then earlier this evening, we agreed to continue um, 212 Pleasant Street also to that date. So that will also take place on the 20, on October 24th. Um, after that, we have, we don't have anything on the calendar, I don't believe, um, but the next dates, the dates in November would be the, the 14th and the 28th. And the dates in December would be the 12th and the 26th. Um, 
So those will be the, the remaining meetings um, through the end of the year. Mr. Chairman, are there the any board. 40Bs uh, that are in line that we know of? Not that I'm aware of. Um, one of the safe harbor provisions is if the, when the board approves um, a decision, I believe it's a six, it's a one year um, moratorium essentially. And so, um, assuming that the that the town, you know, has, has that these that the decisions are uh, not appealed, so currently. Um, the decision for 1021-1027 Mass Ave was not appealed. Uh, the decision for Thorndike Place is no longer under appeal. And the decision for 10 Sunnyside Avenue, um, I don't know if they have if they're outside of their appeal period or not. They may still be within the appeal period. But um that those having been approved um and moving forward, that would grant us um some some relief from a new 40B application being uh, provided. And then after that, it's a question of um, the town would need to uh, reevaluate whether it meets the one and a half percent land area um, dedicated to affordable housing. Because at this point, we're still very short of the 10% the of all residential units. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, in light of all of these things happening, uh, is I wonder if there is any reason to reconsider whether um, approval of the MBTA community's zoning is essential in order for the town to uh, participate in the fossil fuel free project, whether it, one of the other provisions that that law of, having to do with reasonable progress might conceivably apply. There, certainly there is a lot more activity than we would have imagined a year or so ago. Hmm. I know very little about the... About I have not, that, I have not looked mechanism. and should have, uh, but you're, the, you're, the comment that the chair just made raised in my mind the possibility that we may have options that we had not previously thought of no. Yeah. Is that under the jurisdiction of the ARB somehow? The, uh, no, the, the, well, the MBTA communities is under the ARB adopted a recommendation that will be the main motion uh, in the, in town meeting. Um, at that point, town meeting will do whatever in its wisdom it decides to do. Uh, and it, things can be amended and all kinds of things like that. Um, the further, but that has to do with the adoption of the rezoning to begin with, and it would be like every other kind of rezoning. It operates in the same way. Okay. The one of the issues that has been raised is that under the statute that authorizes the town to implement a fossil fuel free. Um, uh, 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 and be part of a demonstration project and to forbid new, uh, in most cases, forbid new fossil fuel combustion in new buildings is and in major renovations, uh, you have to meet one or another of uh, a series of, of housing requirements, one of which would have been the 10% that we are very far away from and from uh, uh, qualifying for. One is actually enacting a uh, in and in time and by this February, uh, enacting a um, uh, MBTA Communities Act, and the third has to do with having making reasonable progress under a housing production plan, and you know we we again have done a lot of 40B stuff uh, during that period of time, and it's conceivable to me that. Uh, it's worth taking another look to see whether that provides an alternative, an alternative way to qualify under the statute. I'm not saying that it does. It's just this conversation suggested that I will that I should go look at the statute and see. With regard to the ten percent, is that no, no, no. The the one of the requirements, one of the potential ways of qualifying is that if you're making reasonable progress under a housing production plan. And 
the question in my in my mind is whether or not the 40Bs that we have will will qualify under that provision. Yeah. And that just means I got to go look at it. And and, yeah. and I'm sure that the town itself is looking at it. it. It's just that I had not really expected all at once at a key time to be looking at so many, looking at Thorndike and 1021 Mass and the at 10 Sunnyside, all of which could potentially come to fruition before the deadline of the statute. But I, I'm not saying that that can happen either. It's just a question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I ask through you, Mr. Handlin, a question about um, the the, what are the st statements you just made? Sure. Mm -hmm. I, 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 statements is too official uh, a term. I just want to ask a question in terms of your understanding, Mr. Handlin, of the of the pilot project for the fossil fuels. My understanding was it was no more gas hookups meaning to natural gas lines in, in uh, the street. Um, is it your understanding that this is also covers the addition of propane tanks in the front yard that feed a furnace in a house on a new con new construction? Um, I don't think that, uh, I do know that the propane tanks in your backyard fueling a grill don't count. Right. Uh, if if it is actually heating your house, I I am not. I believe that that would not be that would not qualify under that. But I'd have to look carefully at the statute. The I should emphasize that one of the things that has happened in the program is that rather than being a pure Berkeley Brookline style uh release the hookups it actually fits into the uh enforcement mechanisms of the uh, stretch code and the specialized stretch code which the town has also bought in mm -hmm. and uh so the procedurally that will they will work together um and i'm sure that mr champa and the state will work all that out to make it work uh seamlessly uh but that is some difference uh, between that and the bylaw that we additionally adopted, I think that Miss uh, that that Talia has a uh, Talia Fox has a memorandum relating to the fossil fuel project that carefully parses out where they're the same and where they're a little different from the bylaw that we already adopted. Oh, okay, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I just wanted to, it's my ignorance. I know that I haven't done my homework here. I just, just wondered if off the top of your head, you, yeah, and you were very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, may I have, as Mr. Hanlon's saying, there is that information by Ms. Fox is available. It was heard by the select board last Wednesday, and there's a very good summary um, as part of those materials on the website for anybody who's interested. Um, in what it does and doesn't do. And I know last night the redevelopment board um, voted on, they had 12 uh, articles for the special town meeting. Uh, so they met last night to uh, debate and approve final language. So that will be, my understanding is that'll, their report will come out on Friday and that will indicate what is in the, the base uh, vote for, um, the MBTA communities uh, uh, subdistrict that they're they're working on. Mr. Chairman, it also is worth noting that there's been a commitment that the MBTA communities that uh, is, uh, it's so complicated. I mean, there they, there were so many options that were going back and forth, and fairly substantial revisions were made um, that those will not be heard by town meeting before the twenty third. So tell mm, me, okay. we'll end up starting with other other articles than that one, and and that one at earliest would be the twenty third. That doesn't say it will necessarily start on the twenty third. <laughs> it kind of depends on, on where you are on everything else. But this will be a very interesting and and uh, fairly long town meeting. Yes, unusual for a fall. All right, three minutes. Three minutes. We can get going. Okay, Mr. Chair. Well, another question is to take up some time. Um, <laughs> if, if you're willing. Um, I must have missed 
the final meetings related to 10 Sunnyside, uh, maybe maybe the decision is still being written. I'm not, you said it was in the appeal period, so I must have missed the going over of the final decision. Did that so the final decision? Yeah, so the final decision um, was drafted and approved by the board um, at the beginning of August, I think. I no, no, remember. no, it was in the uh, beginning of, it was the second meeting in September. Second meeting in September, the okay. 12th, I think, or something like that. Well, I know, I know, I missed one of them. It must have been that one that you, you actually went ahead and did the approval. Okay, I yes, just, we finished that, and yeah, and then there's a certain period of time after we act, and after it is filed with the clerk, which is the operative date for appeals to be filed. And what I think the chair was suggesting earlier is he wasn't quite sure whether that appeal period yeah. is still open or not. Thank you. Colleen, um, I just wanted to say that the DocuSign is up for those. If anybody wants to sign them, why they're waiting. <laughs> ah. Colleen is great. Okay. It is now 9.15. <laughs> so with that, we will return to uh, this is at hand. I thank everyone for their patience. I apologize for overestimating how much time we would need for earlier items. Um, so returning to our agenda, this we will now move on to item number seven on our agenda which is docket 3761, Five Mystic Lake Drive. It's a continuation of a prior hearing that was begun um, in August. And I would turn to Attorney Anessi to um, reintroduce the project and to tell us what has uh, transpired in between since we last were here. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, am accompanied uh, this evening by on standby by John Barrows, who is the PE who handle the conservation matter, uh, and by uh, Mr. Brayton, who is the PE, he, uh, PE who did the traffic study. Uh, we went back, uh, as you suggested we should, and did some more homework. And that homework consisted of uh, having a meeting on site with the tree warden. Mr. Mahoney did that uh, with the tree warden. And uh, Christian, if I could ask you, if you could pull up uh, the letter from the tree warden that is dated September 20 of 2023, <laughs> uh, the, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, the tree warden did take a look at the site, took a look at the existing trees as well. And uh, the, uh, there was a tree plan that was in fact prepared we have that as well. Uh, you should have that, Christian, as well. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, the tree plan uh, was approved uh, by the tree warden, and uh, you should have that tree plan as well. And the uh, the uh, the conclusion on the part of the uh, tree warden was that the plan submitted by my client uh, was in fact. Uh, uh, sufficient, and he approved it. 
Now, with respect to uh, uh, comments that he made in that uh, 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 letter, he made a comment that the uh, the uh, the uh, the tree plan was in fact consistent with the requirements of the bylaw, and he did say that my client had an obligation on an ongoing basis to in fact ensure uh, that the uh, the main stem and critical root zone uh, of the trees uh, uh, tree would be uh, would be preserved according to ASI International Society of Agricultural Best Management Practices. Now, toward that end, we have engaged the services of a uh, 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 a tree company and a tree expert, I should say. And the tree expert basically uh, has come up with a uh, uh, a proposal for us in terms of uh, what we are going to be doing to preserve trees. And that is the uh, report of the accredited tree care uh, a company, Barrett, uh, and their certified uh, 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 tree experts. And basically, uh, we have an ongoing arrangement with him with them with respect to what's going to be done as far as tree preservation is concerned. Uh, I know there was a lot of discussion last time about whether in fact any tree roots uh, were going to be damaged by uh, the driveway that we were going to be uh, installing and by uh, other issues, construction issues as well. And the bottom line on the part of the tree warden is that's not going to happen. And as a method to uh, ensure that that is not going to happen, there'll be a shifting of obligation to my client to continue with that tr tree expert company uh, to preserve uh, the, uh, the viability of the trees. Now, that was one of the issues that was discussed. There was also a uh, discussion about the driveway. And I know there was a lot of discussion uh, about uh, the length of the driveway and whether, in fact, uh, you would have two full-size cars basically overhanging onto the sidewalk uh, with respect to uh, the, the driveway that we were initially proposing. Well, my client went back to David Morgan of the Conservation Commission and spoke to David Morgan uh, about that issue. And David indicated to him that he had discretion to a certain extent with respect to the Conservation Commission rules and regulations to give us another two feet with regard to the length of the driveway. Uh, the what, what we did is uh, we uh, also uh, basically uh, came up with a, uh, a, a calculations, essentially, with regard to uh, how uh, folks would be gauging the length of a car. And uh, a full-size car, and that is on that how long is a car calculation, Christian, that you have, uh, uh, a full-size car is 15.7 feet. Okay. Uh, we will have ample rooms to have two full-size cars in that driveway uh, with respect to uh, parking with no overhang onto the sidewalk. So that's the second issue that we were asked to deal with. The third issue that we were asked to deal with was the issue relating to the uh, traffic, uh, the hmm. location of the second driveway, and essentially uh, the makeup of the street, uh, uh, Mystic Lake Drive. Uh, now, if you uh, had occasion to get down there and to look, take a look at the street, uh, you would have seen that it's a pretty quiet street. 
the in the traffic study bears that out. We did a traffic study, and if you could bring that up, Christian, on your uh, screen uh, as well, that's the traffic study of uh, uh, data September 20 of 2023 uh, by, uh, strike that, sorry. Uh, that's the traffic study of Bryant, Bryant and Associates dated September, uh, September 25 of 2023. That traffic study indicates that the uh, proposed second driveway is located on the north side of Mystic Lake Drive, approximately 55 feet from Mystic Valley Parkway. There is an existing driveway for six Mystic Lake Drive, almost directly across from the proposed driveway. Mystic Lake Drive is a two-way a uh, two-lane roadway in a residential neighborhood. The traffic counts were taken on Mystic Lake Drive in the vicinity of the proposed driveway over a 24-hour period on September, 7, uh, September 14 of 2023. There were 84 vehicles during the 24-hour period, 24 period with 42 vehicles traveling in both the eastbound and the westbound directions. Due to the distance of the driveway from Mystic Valley Parkway, it is anticipated that the vehicles are driving at a low rate of speed when they come off of Mystic Valley Parkway, because quite frankly, uh, they do not have the ability to conjure up any, uh, any, uh, any speed because of that short distance. Uh, based on a, a review of the proposed driveway, the low traffic volumes and low anticipated vehicle speeds on Mystic Lake Drive, there do not appear to be any safety concerns with the location of the proposed driveway. Now that's the uh, conclusion of Brian Associates, Todd E. Brayton. Uh, the, now, th there was a further issue that I think Christian had brought up and Christian brought up uh, a uh, a question with regard to whether we might need bollards with regard to that mechanical uh, uh, a piece of equipment that uh, was located in the roadway. We are certainly willing to, to do that if, in fact, that is something that the board wants us to do. Uh, and we're open to that uh, in, in terms of what those bollards might consist of as well. Now, the one thing I want to <clears throat> emphasize uh, this evening is that <clears throat> we're not talking conservation, okay? We've had a conservation hearing. Uh, the conservation hearing issued an order of conditions. The order of conditions was recorded at the Registry of Deeds. That's history. That's been done. Uh, I, I, I brought in uh, Mr. Barrows anyway on standby just in case anybody had any for, anyone from the board had any questions about that. But uh, I don't believe that we uh, should be getting into conservation issues as far as the hearing is concerned. Uh, I think we have, and, and by the way, the, uh, it, it, <laughs> this has been beaten into the ground, okay? Yes, it's in an R2 zone. Yes, it was a single family house. I will say that again. I'm the one who brought that out initially, okay? I brought that out, not anyone else, okay? And quite frankly, it's been beaten into the ground. If it's brought up again, that is certainly overkill, okay? That's not an issue before the board, and it shouldn't be an issue before the board. Uh, with that having been said, uh, Bill Mahoney, would you like to jump in and make some comments? Yeah, hello. Thank you for taking the time, folks. I just wanted to tell, give the some of the neighbors really an idea of who I am. I, I'm, I've been living in this town for more than 50 years. I've got three children in the Arlington Public Schools, and there's, there seems to be concerns here about permits being um, properly pulled. And more recently, there's been two permits pulled, uh, and it seems as they're trying to make me make it out as though not pulling permits. And certainly moving forward, everything's going to be done by the book. 
Uh, I, and again, I regret not having more contact with the neighbors in the initially. It's my first time doing the conservation um, commission thing, and I had no idea I would have to do this when I bought the property. Um, but here I am, and certainly moving forward, I, mean, I have no issues contacting the neighbors and having regular conversations with them as far as the construction and the entire process. That's all I want to say. Thank you. I, I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, and, and again, I've said this before. This is an R2 zone, okay? No one living in the R2 zone should be surprised that my client wants to construct a two-family house in the R2 zone. The difference is that he's looking for two driveways, okay? That's the issue before the board, okay? He's looking for two driveways. Now, there's a new uh, home going up, uh, uh, a two-family home going up at the other end of Mystic Lake Drive, okay, as well uh, on the street. And I'm given to understand, by the way, that there has been a lot of controversy about that in terms of uh, folks in the neighborhood uh, complaining about that as well. Again, it's a two-family zone. This is what two-family zones uh, are designed to uh, for. This is what town meeting decided when they said we want this to be a two-family zone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Um, I'm just gonna quickly put the uh, plan back up. Um, oh, by the way, I, I didn't mention one, one more. We, we also went ahead and did uh, a revised site plan showing the plantings with respect to the buffers on either side uh, of the lot. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I did just, I know that last time there was specific concern about the driveway and I believe it was uh, the, the tree I'm circling here uh, in the proximity, proximity. And just to confirm with you, you have uh, moved this driveway and changed its angle in order to um, increase the distance between the, the curb cut and the tree. Is that correct? That, I get this, Bob. Yes, I met Christian with the uh, tree warden out there myself, and he's the one who came up with that measurement, and that's why we did that, of course, yes. Okay. Um, and then also, this does show uh, the screening planting that's required for parking uh, that would occur in a side yard, and it occurs on both sides. Um, and I'm sorry, the uh, Mr. Nessa, can you just uh, repeat again in uh, regards to uh, protection of the electric box? Yes, uh, we are uh, we are open to uh, bollards being placed uh, to protect that that uh, uh, electrical box, and what form the board would want us to take to make that happen, uh, we are open to that as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I had a I'll go ahead and stop sharing this. Um, so I had had a conversation earlier today um, with uh, uh, David Morgan, who's the, the town's conservation agent. Um, so uh, the other question that had to come up is that in the zoning bylaws, section 5.7, which is the floodplain district, um, and the floodplain district imposes um, a variety of restrictions on development that can happen for projects. For projects that are proposed within that district um, and the applicability of it um, is that you know any proposed use structure development filling grading or excavation within the floodplain district shall be governed by all regulations of the section um, and it says that the extent of the floodplain district shall be determined by the conservation commission so i had asked them specifically specifically about that as to whether or not this property fell within um, what would be considered the floodplain district. And uh, he and I reviewed the the firm maps that are produced by, by FEMA. Um, and he had noted that the applicants had submitted a letter which had been accepted by the Conservation Commission and by, uh, by FEMA that indicated a change a requested change in the in the firm, which would um, still have a portion of the property within 
the floodplain district, but the locate, but the portion of the property where the house stands would be outside of the floodplain because it is higher than uh, the, the flood elevation. And so um, I just uh, present as, as initial background to the board that uh, in the determination based on the that letter that was submitted and accepted by the Conservation Commission, um, the, uh, the location on the property where the house is proposed is outside of the floodplain district. Um, there has been some conversation as to whether if any part of the property is within the floodplain Plain district, it the restriction applies to the entire parcel or not? Um, and it's a conversation we can have. Um, the uh, in reading the this section of the code, it, I don't see somewhere where it specifically speaks in that fashion. It talks more about um, sort of areas, uh, but I. It's it's something that um, that the board can just can discuss as a part of its deliberations. Um, I would also note that the board is in receipt of several um, letters uh, from a resident in the neighborhood, um, and those are all on the zoning board of appeals uh, website for this hearing. Um, so with that, I would. Are there questions from the board uh, for the applicant? Seeing none. With that, I will go ahead and move to the next uh, next phase on this, which would be uh, public comment period. Uh, so public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and is to be addressed by the board uh, for the purpose of in helping us inform our decision. Um, as many people have already found, you can uh, use the raise hand button on the reactions tab in Zoom, or if you're calling in, you can dial star nine, but I don't see anybody having uh, being calling in at the moment. Um, so with that, um, the first person in the queue is uh, Ms. Joanne Preston. Okay. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Name okay. and address of the record, please. Yes. Joanne Preston, 42 Mystic Lake Drive, <clears throat> um, which is, by the way, Mystic Lake Drive is only two blocks long. <laughs> we have two construction sites. Um, I, I'd like to first comment on the protection of the trees and that there's going to be someone hired to overlook everything for some period of time. Um, this is a developer. I'm sure as soon as the units are finished, they will be sold. So any protection will expire when they're sold. Secondly, there was a comment on, you know, it's a two family, you can do a two family, you still have to obey the law. And one of the reasons that the neighbors have been so concerned about the trees is the first thing the developer did was to pull a large truck on the on the property and knock off a large limb of the state trees. No one has looked into what will happen to the straight state trees. Um, so <clears throat> I also had a, a few questions of the developer's lawyer. Can I ask him directly? Uh, you can ask me and I can forward your question. Okay. <laughs> Um, he begins his letter to you referencing a September 22nd survey. I didn't find a survey. I found a site plan. No, so, I, I said site no. plan. Mr. Yep. It's not a survey. It's a site plan. Shut up. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've had a very hard time, and even with... Uh, a magnifying glass, um, seeing some of the numbers. And one thing that the arborist didn't do is he didn't calculate the amount of space, at least on what you submitted, maybe you did elsewhere, how much um, 
what would the distance of tree number two, for instance, would be from the driveway? I think it's there in small numbers, but I think it's 12 point something. Go ahead and open that up again. Oh. There's a whole way of calculating it, which the tree warms only. It's the DBH time. Um, it is one inch of the DBH needs to have 10 inches of root divided by two, and then you have so on. So is it? The, the, oh, the distance I, that is you know, shown on it's 12.5, okay. 12.5 feet. Yeah, and I wanna ask now with the two feet that was added to the driveways, um, how long the driveway is? The other thing to add to that, or do you, does it matter? Hmm? How long is the driveways? Believe, I mean, looking at this stuff, so I'm assuming that this dashed line is for the proposed parking space of 20 feet long. And then there's an additional 12.9. Yeah, so it's approximately 33 feet to the to the sidewalk, Christian. 33 feet, okay. Yeah, just okay. under that is what we okay. have here. I mean, again, I don't know at the end of the day, well, okay. maybe an inch or two shorter or a longer by an inch. That, add, that adds the two feet on, right? Correct. Yes. Okay, well, <clears throat> my reading of the zoning bylaw 6.1.11, parking and loading spaces standards, that, that is still in violation of the bylaw because the bylaw, I'll read you the relevant part, says, um, except that some spaces which are open and unobstructed at one end may be only 15 feet in length per car. So that's 36 feet. That goes for the other driveway too. I could read the whole citation if you like, but so you that's said what this, it says. this is in six one eleven. Six, yeah, one eleven. Yeah. So the. So technically a parking space is eight and a half by 18. Um, and so the two is 36. <laughs> right. But for the, the, by the zoning bylaw, we're only allowed to require a single parking space per unit. Um, and, and that has to be beyond the confines of the front yard. So uh, both of them have uh, provide that dimension. Um, it, this one is 20 and this one is also uh, 20 feet. So there's two feet, then there's an additional space beyond that. This cannot be considered a parking space. We had asked specifically that they elongate the driveway um, because it, you know, it was known that there would likely be two cars parked in tandem in the driveway. But we, because it's not technically a parking space, we can't, it would, they do have one parking space, which they're required by code, and it is of the size that it's required to be. So if there were two cars there, they most likely will overhang the sidewalk. The, well, the, the information provided by the applicant was they felt that um, because the average, they provided documentation about the average length of a car and the parking space is long, the total driveway length is longer than twice that dimension, so they feel it, that it would be appropriate. Um, but if the car was to be parked block, you know, interfering with the with the sidewalk, that's a matter for the police department. Okay. Um. So it doesn't it doesn't require this for tandem parking. No, we had just specifically requested that they try to elongate the driveways in anticipation that you know, we would want to avoid having a car overhang as best as possible. So the only thing the town requires is 18 feet for one car. That's correct. And it has to be beyond the front yard setback. Which is 12 point what? 12.9 for the building. 
And the rest of the driveway is what? Uh, it's 20 feet beyond that. So the 20 feet meets the requirement of the 18 feet law, right? Correct. So the parking, it does provide parking that is compliant with the zoning bylaw. It, with the exception that it needs a special permit in order to have a second driveway. Yes. And what are the conditions for a second driveway? So uh, the board needs to make uh, three findings in regards to a second driveway. Mm -hmm. um, the second driveway would have to be added in a manner that avoids an undue concentration of population. That a second driveway can be added in a manner that allows adequate provision of transportation. And that the second driveway may be added in a manner that conserves the value of land and the buildings in the vicinity. So there's nothing about safety. Um, not specifically, except that because it's a special permit, um, the third criteria for a special permit is that it will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Okay. Um, well, I still maintain that it does because you can't... You have to move this map a little bit. <laughs> when people turn right off of Mystic Valley Parkway, which is a very popular cut through, they have to make a very sharp turn. And now that the driveway has been moved in particular, mm -hmm. I think that creates a danger. The fact that there's a driveway on the other side, the traffic is going in the other direction so that it can see it has good sight lines all the way down and that makes that driveway not as dangerous but we should we should hear from some other people okay thank you very much um back uh next on our list is mr moore Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I find myself in the unusual position of uh, um, disagreeing a little bit with Ms. Preston. Um, I, I, I wanted to um, commend Mr. Anessi and the proponents here about the proactive activity that they've done relative to the trees the tree protections of the root zones, working with the tree warden, getting a real tree plan, all things that are required by the process, of course, but um, it, it showed some really trying to work with the situation, including the, the maintaining of a, a, a tree company to be sure the trees are adequately protected throughout the course of the construction. Um, I think it sounds like there's been some um, some very significant work done here, and I'm, I'm pleased to see it. And uh, I'm glad the tree warden is in agreement that this is a, a good plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, next on my list um, is Brian McLaughlin. Oh, no. Hey, good evening. Are you able to hear me? We are. Just name and address for the record, please. Brian McLaughlin, 15 Mystic Lake Drive, Unit 2, next door. Thank you. And I wanted to second Mr. Moore's comment about the, the diligence and effort that's clearly been put in, not only by the town and the tree warden, um, but, uh, you know, for Mr. Mahoney for um, respecting those rules and, and recommendations and keeping these, these natural assets in place, and arguably a good value improvement for the home as well. Um, I see on the map um, the site plan that the assessed property boundary overlaps into our fence a bit um, on the, yeah, right over there. So I just want to confirm um, if there is any you know, plans to, I guess, take back that fence and demolish it or anything, or if that's going to be left undisturbed um sort of a gentleman's agreement there any any uh, comment from 
from the developers? Yeah, yeah certainly. Uh, I'm open to discuss that with you. If you wanted to leave it, I wouldn't be uh, opposed to that, or I'll put up a new one. We could discuss that, certainly. Like I said, I'm really going to try and be as transparent as possible throughout the process. You guys will all have my phone number and email. Um, that's part of the process as well. Moving forward, I have to send out a letter to the abutters, and certainly you guys, you are one of them. And uh, yeah, so I would absolutely be open to any suggestions. I, I did notice that as well. It's very, it's very close, but yeah, I, I saw that. And uh, that fence is probably on its way out. If you, I don't know if you agree with that or not. And uh, yeah, I, I, I probably put up some sort of a new fence and we can certainly discuss what you got, you'd prefer. And I'd be happy to try and work that out with you. You know, actually you make that comment. Um, it's not clear to me what fence that is. That may be just that picket fence that is on your side of the property. Um, I'd be happy to take this offline, Mr. Mahoney, if you um, if you wouldn't mind leaving a, a note maybe in our mailbox with contact information sure. for you. Bye. Yeah, so we I'm can around. Move on with the meeting. Yeah. Um, I live right up the road. So, yeah, that's no problem. And your number, yeah. What, what was it, Unit 2 you said? I know, obviously, I know it's 15. 15, Unit 2, just uh, uh, send us a post. I'll send my number. I'll drop that in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll drop that in the mail the mailbox and we can certainly have a discussion moving forward. Thank you. We'll, we'll do a walk through and sort it out. No problem. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, next, um, uh, D. Lorenzo's. Hi, um, I, this is Dave DiLorenzo and Charlie O'Connell. We're neighbors directly across the street at 10 Mystic Lake Drive. Um, and we too would like to commend Mr. Mahoney for the proactivity and modifications made so far in response to the Conservation Commission and, and CBA processes that, that the, the project is, has certainly adjusted around some community concerns so far, and that's appreciated. Um, um, I just want to speak narrowly um, to the um, on the on the subject of uh, the traffic study that was done, to the extent that it has any bearing on the placement of the driveway, and really, I don't have the expertise to have an opinion about whether sixty feet is adequate or forty feet is better or anything like that. But to the extent that it was determined by an outside independent evaluator that, that the, the street is a low traffic street. I just want to take issue with that because um, as the parent of a two and a six-year-old who routinely um, are out and about in ways that two and six-year-olds will be, um, you know, I, I put cones out. There's no other way than to put cones out. Um, uh, it's often a quiet street. It's sometimes a very um, it's sometimes a pass-through street um, uh, of, of cars that are non-resident cars that are passing through at high speeds after having been backed up at traffic at the nearby rotary on Medford Street and Mystic Valley Parkway. When that happens, it's, it's not every day. Um, it, it tends to coincide with rainier days, and it wasn't a rainy day when the traffic study was done, but it all, often can happen on non-rainy days, too. Um, when it happens and traffic backs up, then Google Maps or Waze will tell um, folks who are trying to get somewhere fast to use this street. And at that time, people will, having been sitting in their car moving slowly and falling behind in their plans, they will make a fast right turn and aggressively uh, drive on the street. If as part of this process, it were within, within anyone's uh, ability to designate this as a as a residence only street or a street that was, you know, that had a sign saying, um, you know, no turn between these hours that I think that would be appropriate. That would be, um, that would be appreciated. And that would certainly address some of these concerns, but to the extent that this issue is of um, the, 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 the issue of uh, traffic, uh, safety on the street is is part of what will help determine the placement of the of the driveway i think it just should be kept in mind that the findings of that study just um aren't consistent with what we observe on a on a daily basis and uh and that, that that's all for now 
Christian, can I comment briefly on that? I, I was just going to briefly mention to um, yeah, and this Mr. Mr. Lorenzo um, that you should for for concerns about the the traffic. Um, I would absolutely write to the select board and write to the transportation advisory committee. Um, those are the town boards that are in a position to do something about that. Um, and they deal with all the, you know, parking regulations on the street and traffic signs and everything like that. Um, they're very good to work with. I would highly encourage you to talk to the select board and the transportation advisory committee, because that's absolutely something they should be paying attention to. Okay. We'll do that. I, um, Mr. Mahoney. I would certainly be supportive of that too, you guys. And if there's anything I can do to assist, I certainly would be willing to do that. That's great. a great idea. Uh, Mr. NSC, did you have something as well? No. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. Uh, thank you all very much. Are there other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close uh, the public hearing. Um, I do note that Mr. Uh, um, Mr. DiLorenzo and Ms. O'Connell have a have submitted letters to the board that are on the website, um, and Ms. Preston has also, um, in conjunction with um, Barbara Hindley, uh, Serena Bray, Paul Kelly, and Maureen Kelly have um, issued a letter that is in the record as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe Mr. McLaughlin um, has raised his, did raise his hand. Oh, are you closing? Um, thank you, Mr. Mr. Moore, for bringing that to my attention. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, I stuck in for a second, second time. Yeah, there. Apologies. Um, adding on to Dave's uh, comments, you know, we have a new five-year-old neighbor downstairs, and um, our happy parents of a newborn. Um, unrelated to this property in particular, but if there's any venue or way to request a you know, bright yellow, you know, children's zone or, or some some sort of cautionary sign to folks as they whip around that corner on Mystic Valley Parkway, that might be a, um, something towards that direction of helping to maintain some amount of alertness and uh, and safety on that street. Thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the streets are outside of our jurisdiction, but um... It does sound like there you know, this is a sizable community concern and it, uh, having a you know, some kind of a joint letter to the select board and the transportation advisory committee. Um, hopefully we'll get the ball rolling on doing something because it, it certainly sounds like it's a something that is on everyone's mind in this neighborhood and should definitely be taken care of. Um, so with that, I will close the public comment period um, on this hearing and uh, come back to the board so that the decision that is in front of the board, um, the application, it, it's for the second driveway. Everything else um, has been vetted through the Conservation Commission. Um, and the letter from the uh, Special Services Department notes that uh, the property that is the existing building is a single family dwelling located in an R2 zoning district. The appellant Applicant consulted in special services regarding adding a second driveway. And per the Arlington Zoning Bylaw, Section 6110, location of parking spaces, subsection A, parking in residential districts, for single family, two family duplex, three family dwellings in the R0, R1, R2, R3, or R4 districts, not more than one driveway shall be permitted unless there's a finding by the special permit granting authority for the development that a second driveway or a driveway that makes more than one intersection with the street may be added in a manner which avoids an undue concentration of population, allows adequate provisions of transportation, and conserves the value of land and buildings in the vicinity. Um, so those are the findings that the board would be required to make and um, to assist in that the board would also um, apply the seven uh, standard conditions uh, not conditions, excuse me, the seven standard uh, findings required for a special permit. Um, so turning back to the board, are there additional questions um, or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I guess there are, 
the, the chair mentioned earlier the existence of a separate set of rules regarding to the uh, uh, parts of wetlands protection in the, uh, zone in the bylaw flood protection zone. Um, and I'm wondering where, if anywhere, that fits within the decision that we are uh, uh, we're being asked to make. It sort of is an unusual situation here in that uh, ISD does not, as far as I know, have an opinion at this point as to whether or not uh, there is a violation of any of the provisions of that section of the code. Um, and I'm a little bit unclear about the way in which that, whether that is actually even in, before us at all. Uh, and if it is, uh, what we need to make of it in order to apply the rules that are clearly in front of us that the chair just read. So I did have a conversation um, with uh, with Director Champa in regards to uh, 5.7. Um, I believe... Um, I think I have an email from him. Um, just can't remember if it was over email or if it's something we talked about on the phone. Oh, I'm just checking. Um, I believe it was over the phone. Um, So he had spoken with with um, with David Morgan, the conservation um, agent of the town, and the question has sort of gone back and forth a little bit. Uh, but the understanding that I had from speaking with Director Champa was that um, he did not feel that that because the um, the area of the building was outside of the floodplain. And with uh, in a manner that was approved by the conservation commission, that five point seven was not applicable to the building. Well, Mr. Um, Chairman, I wonder whether we could just <clears throat> what we've been asked to do is approve the two mm -hmm. entrances onto the street. Um, right. I don't. I think it is difficult for us to have an independent position with respect to this uh, as compared to ISD and the Conservation Commission. And it doesn't seem to me true that if we were to approve the uh, two entrances onto the street, that that would necessarily imply any judgment on our part uh, about mm -hmm. whether 5.7 applies. That would still be something that is up to Mr. Champa if he were to decide that it did, contrary to what he has just told you, that it did apply and that it created a problem here, uh, then that would set up a new proceeding uh, that we could uh, then address the issue uh, when it's properly presented to us. So it seems to me that we should just sort of say, whatever we do is not doesn't have any effect on that question. We're not making a decision one way or the other and haven't been asked to make a decision one way or the other on whether 5.7 applies or whether if it did, did apply, whether it has any up, whether it would preclude what the applicant is proposing here, in which case we have a fairly simple set of three main criteria, three findings that we have to make. It seems to me that of those three, that there's no serious contention that this would be an undue concentration of population. Um, it probably, I don't, we, have, we have not heard anything very persuasive about pre conserving the value of land and buildings in the vicinity. So that really kind of puts us right up against the adequate provision of transportation as the major area that we have to make a finding on. And the the second driveway, yeah, and also it's the question of whether conserves the value of land and building, whether it has any impact on adjoining properties. The adjoining property is not uh, on one side, the side with the existing driveway. Um, 
that's the exist that that basically that driveway is being relocated within the site, but the new driveway is the one that is closer to Mystic Valley Parkway, which abuts uh, land that I'm not entirely sure who the owner is, whether it's the state or or the town for that parkland that abuts the the parkway. I, I believe that's the state, but I'm not certain, uh, Christian. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the board, um, in order to determine if the board should move forward with an approval, we need to review uh, the findings that the board would need to make. Uh, so the this is under section 6.1.10a, uh, the location of parking spaces. Um, so the second driveway may be added in a manner that avoids an undue concentration of population. Um, so this, this is a two-family or proposed two-family dwelling in a two-family district. Um, it was originally developed as a single-family home. It is now being redeveloped as a two-family home, which meets the zoning requirements. Um, so I would recommend that the board find uh, that it does not create an undue concentration of population. Um, Second driveway may be added in a manner that allows adequate provision of transportation. Um, I would take that to mean that it does not interfere with the, the flow of traffic in the street um, and does and provide and provides uh, adequate space for tra uh, personal transportation for the owners of the home. Um, and as, as Mr. Hanlon noted, that's sort of the question here is, does the adding a second driveway, does it create a, an issue for uh, for traffic safety on Mystic Valley Drive, Mystic, excuse me, Mystic Lake Drive? Um, and the, the third, whether the second driveway can be added in a manner that conserves the value of land and buildings in the vicinity. Um, I think the, the addition of the driveway with the plantings uh, involved in the screening and the screening that's on both sides that that will be um, will not be a detriment to the uh, to the remainder of the neighborhood um, and then we did note that the they are required to provide uh, landscaping and setback in the side yard uh, between the edge of the property and the driveway and they are showing that on their plans and they do have an approved plan from the tree warden um does anyone have any question about those three uh findings mr chairman seeing none nope. uh, cool. yes sir mr hanlon um so i'm sorry i need to go back on my on vision so it's it's I'm, I was sort of, I've been struck by the conversation that took place during the last several minutes of the public uh, thing. Obviously, I mean, when I went up to look at this neighborhood, I believe actually I was there on a day when Mr. DiLorenzo had to move the cones in the street. Um, clearly, it is a kind of street where people, where it took and play. And clearly, it on the day I was there, there was all, there was no other car in sight, and and I sort of stayed and waited to see whether there would be more people, and there weren't. Um, and I think that that when Mister, I think it was Mister DiLorenzo characterized this as a street that's a quiet street, except when it isn't, um, is where the problem is. Um, and I think that's a problem that Mr. Mahoney indicates he he shares and would like to solve for the basis of the people who uh, he's preparing a new houses for. Um, and I'm sort of persuaded that if everybody could get together, that there are a lot of traffic calming measures that could address the situation that exists, and that would have a great deal more impact than the problem than the problem of which of how many driveways there are, which I think would have a It'd be fairly marginal uh, in terms of the real problem that exists. And I'm actually encouraged that with all of the discussion that's taken place, and I know that there have been uh, difficult feelings about these sorts of things, that the discussion we ended with was a constructive one that was aimed at improving the entire neighborhood. And I'd like both to commend people for doing that, but also I think that uh, Mr. Mahoney and his, and his ultimately his uh, 
people he sells to will be useful additions to the neighborhood and that they will help get these problems solved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, the other findings that the board would be required to make are the standard seven findings for a special permit, um, that the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. Um, this is a special permit under 6110A, uh, so it is allowable by special permit. Uh, requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, so off-street parking, uh, the town still does not allow on-street parking, uh, having off-street parking that is not uh, shared with another, um, with a different homeowner um, is is certainly is helpful. Uh, the If they were not able to add the second driveway, they would need to um, add parking uh, along the existing parking. So it'd be much more parking um, directly against the abiding neighbor at 15 Mystic Lake Drive. Um, so I think it's, it's desirable to avoid avoid that condition. Um, that it would not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, I think the adding a second driveway does create you know another opportunity where there are cars crossing the public uh, the public sidewalk. I think that the proper placement of the plantings because uh, you're you're not allowed to have anything taller than 30 inches within five feet of the property line. So I think having uh, shorter plantings adjacent to the sidewalk to make sure that the sight lines are not impaired. Um, be helpful not only for uh, pedestrians, but also for uh, seeing traffic that may be moving onto the street. Um, will not overload any public system. Uh, public systems would not be affected and this does not uh, add any water to the street because it's a pervious driveway. Um, would not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, that while it has been noted in some of the um, some of the correspondence that you know property having two driveways are not common in this neighborhood. Um, the length of the property line on Mystic Lake Drive. Uh, does make it so that uh, the distance between the driveways being over 60 feet um, does appear to be sufficient to uh, maintain the character of the neighborhood. Uh, would not be detrimental to public health or welfare. Um, it is just a driveway. And with, uh, with the proper uh, screening and the proper sight lines, it will maintain uh, public safety and will not cause an undue, to cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, it is a two family in a two family zone uh, and driveways are, there are driveways in the zone and this driveway can be added with a, in a way that doesn't impair the land. Um, and so I think it would not be detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, so that's the, the way I would address those findings. Are there any questions from the board in regards to the seven findings? Mr. Chair. None. Yes, sir. I, I just I, just a comment, if it's okay. Um, so, sure. so I know we've we've reviewed similar cases to this in our two neighborhoods about adding a, a secondary driveway, and I think it's always come down for these seven conditions, the special permit conditions, to the safety and the character, and and oftentimes in those conditions, it's because uh, they're mid mid block uh, plots, and uh, the second driveway would essentially remove all the the green space along the street um uh, i think i think in this case um because of the unique size of the lot and um kind of the big buffering that happens along the valley parkway at the corner uh that this is a, a, as good an application as any to add a second driveway so i would be in favor of of that thank you mr chairman mr hanlon just as a quick addition to that, we might want to pass on to the ARB uh, that when we discuss what we actually do when we apply these conditions, it mm -hmm. is only with some degree of, of poetic license 
that we actually squeeze our real considerations into the language. So Mr. Mr. Riccardelli is quite right. We are very often dealing with, with trees and green space and so on. That nowhere appears in the criteria that were the findings that we're supposed to make. We sort of import them by talking about the value of buildings and things like that. But it would be better to have a bylaw that actually focuses in on what the real considerations are and directs us to make the findings that are appropriate given those uh, those rather than have generic things that we have to then uh, interpret to make them actionable criteria. So it's something we've had problems with this provision for quite for a long time. And uh, it it isn't it hasn't gotten fixed, but I just wanted to stress that that I'm always more comfortable where the decisions that we're being asked to make are the actual decisions that matter for both the for the public and for the yeah, people in the neighborhood. Well, point well taken. Thank you. Um, so when we had originally taken this up on August 29th, um, I had made a couple of com notes about potential conditions. Um, so the board would, should the board be voting to approve? We, we have the three standard conditions that we've already read into the record this evening. Uh, so we would have those. There was also a note here that the board requests the applicant to work with a tree warden. Um, that has already happened. So I don't think we need to include that as a condition. Um, there was a proposed condition that the board has neither discussed nor taken a position on section 5.7 floodplain district in the zoning bylaw, um, which I think we would amend to say the board has not taken a position on section 5.7. Um, there was a proposed condition about the applicant is to comply with applicable local and state bylaws bylaws and regulations regarding public street trees. Um, I think that their conversation with the tree warden um, has already addressed that concern. Uh, the applicant is to provide a bollard to protect the electrical service box from the driveway. Um, I think that is still a reasonable um, condition and that's something the applicant has agreed to do. Um, the driveways are to be 18 feet in length from the edge of the sidewalk to the provided parking spaces. Um, this was discussed by the applicant that they um, they were able to extend the driveways by two feet, but were not able to extend them further. Um, and requiring that they extend them further would most likely require that they go back to the Conservation Commission. Um, the applicant has provided uh, uh, some evidence that the the uh, standard size of a car is 15.7 feet. So, um, you know, 31.4 would be the the length and the driveways are 33 feet. So um, unless there is a strong desire to include this, I was gonna go ahead and recommend that we not pursue that as a condition. Um, and the drawings now show the landscape buffer. So that no longer needs to be a condition either. So as I have it here, we have the three standard conditions with two additional, one being that the board has take has not taken a position on section 5.7 floodplain district and the zoning bylaw, and that the applicant is to provide a bollard to protect the electrical service box from the driveway. Um, so those would be the five conditions. Are there any additional conditions that the board would want to include should the board choose to vote to approve? Being none, um, unless there's any other questions from the board, I would entertain a motion on this application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the application, uh, that the uh, board approve the application subject to the three standard conditions, plus the two additional conditions relating to section 5.7 of the zoning bylaw and the provision of bollards uh, that the applicant has agreed to. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to approve a special permit for Five Mystic Lake Drive with the uh, 
three standard conditions and two additional conditions, um, special permit to grant a uh, second driveway. Cool. So vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Mr. Chair, am I eligible to vote on this? I was not at the previous meeting. Oh, you were not. That's right. Thank you for reminding me. Mr. LeBlanc is a similar condition. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that uh, special permit is approved. Christian, sorry to interrupt. I just had one question with respect to the bollards. Do you, I mean, do you need one on each side yeah. of that box or just near the driveway side? Um, so the way it, the, the condition implies from the driveway side. Okay, just wanted to be clear. Thank you very much. No. Just, a, just so okay, somebody's yeah. backing up that they don't hit it when they back up. Of course. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, all of you. Appreciate your time. Um, so with that, we move on to the next item on our agenda, which is docket 3767, 77 Tanager Street. Yes. Um, again, this was with Mr. Anessi. So, yes. Mr. Anessi, if you could introduce us to this project. Yes, uh, this is a situation where we are looking for relief under Section 5.3.9, Projections into Minimum Yards. Now, uh, I hope we haven't bored you, Christian, by sending you photographs, okay? But the client thought it would be important for you to have the photographs to show what the uh, the uh, porch area would have looked like uh, late 1950s, early 1960s. And uh, I also sent you a photograph showing the concrete platform that was there then. Now, my client has talked to Mike Champa and uh, asked Mike Champa because I posed the question with him, and I said, uh, I, I want an answer on uh, on your, your building. It's a two, you're using it as a two, it's in an R1 zone, uh, and uh, what does Mike Champa say about that? And uh, Mike Champa indicated to my client that the building was built as a two family in the year 1908. Uh, and so that uh, basically was the response we got from Ms. Champa. Now you've got a plan from uh, Mr. Uh, Scott Lynch of Rover Survey that basically shows you the dimensions of the proposed addition. And that's the proposed plot plan of 77 Tanager Road. And uh, you have that, Christian. I don't yep. know whether you can pull that up or not. Uh, just did. It, it, yeah, there we go. All right. And that shows the dimensions uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the proposed addition. You also have two sketches, uh, which were submitted by uh, myself in behalf of the applicant with respect to uh, the uh, dimensions uh, of the proposed addition. What we are proposing is not a relief under the first portion of section 5.3.9, but rather under the second portion, uh, the language being enclosed entrances larger than that allowed and larger than that allowed me, meaning uh, uh, having gone through the first portion, which reads the uh, projecting eaves, et cetera, that uh, do not uh, extend more than 25 square feet in floor area or more than one story high, which do not project more than three and a half feet beyond the line of the foundation wall, may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations, otherwise provided for in the district in which the structure is built. Well, we, uh, in my opinion, we cannot comply with that. So therefore we go to uh, the second portion uh, of the language in section 5.3.9. And so we're looking to do an enclosed uh, porch area. 
The reason for the enclosed porch area is that the client would like to have some protection uh, for the interior of the building from the winter elements. Uh, and right now there, there would be no protection uh, from the winter elements because when you open the door to the interior of the building, you're gonna have snow coming in and, uh, and the like. Uh, whereas if you have this enclosed area, uh, the enclosed area would serve as a buffer to the interior of the building. Uh, we're asking uh, that the board uh, grant a special permit in connection with uh, section 5.3.9. We believe that we have satisfied the, uh, the uh, special permit criteria. The uh, property uh, is uh, defined in the bylaw as being a special permit use, the use, the uh, uh, the use we're seeking. Uh, the, uh, uh, as I've indicated, uh, explain why the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Well, it's uh, desirable or convenient to the public convenience or welfare, uh, uh, certainly uh, for the public convenience, uh, certainly for the convenience or welfare of the inhabitants of the building because of what I just said in terms of the buffer area. Uh, the uh, why the use will not create undue traffic congestion or undue, uh, unduly impair pedestrian safety. There will be no increase in traffic congestion because the building will be used exactly the way it's been used uh, historically. There will be no overload of any municipal systems. Uh, once again, there will be no change in the occupancy of the building. Uh, any regulations for the use as may be provided for in the zoning bylaw, uh, included but not limited to the provisions of section eight are fulfilled and the indication that I have indicated there is, they are fulfilled. Uh, explain why the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts, it will be detrimental to the health or welfare. Uh, I My argument there is the propo proposed addition is in keeping uh, with the physical characteristics of other homes uh, in, in, in the neighborhood. We're not introducing an aberration into the neighborhood, something that is going to be totally out of place with what already exists in the neighborhood. Uh, with regard to the... Uh, why the addition will not basically cause an excess of that uh, use. I think that's easily answered. Uh, the, it's not going to cause an excess of that use. Uh, if people want to have that kind of a, uh, a porch area leading to their front door, it's not the kind of a use that I think that provision in the bylaw is contemplating, okay? I think that provision in the bylaw is contemplating a different kind of a use that would have a more general impact on a neighborhood rather than having a specific impact on a particular property. So we are asking uh, that the board uh, grant us relief. And I do have Mr. Danucci with me, by the way, uh, who is prepared to address you uh, as well. If you have any questions for him, he is the owner and he is the uh, developer. And uh, I'm given to understand, if I'm not talking out of school, that one of the things that he would like to do at, uh, at some point soon is move, perhaps move, even have it. Well, his mother's living in there now, but maybe move her from one floor to another, uh, one area to another. So he's anxious to get the construction completed as soon as he can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I had a couple of questions. I had corresponded back with um, uh, with Mr. Anessi, with Attorney Anessi in regards to uh, some questions with the dimensional sheet, um, which was reissued. Um, so the existing 
building is uh, 3,900, is it 39? <laughs> it's still quirky. So what, so the GFA of the project yep. is listed as being 3939, 3938, yep. and 3937. Yep. yep. Um, so um, I had hoped that that would get cleaned up, but it's there's still multiple oh, square footage for the house. To do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go with the 3938 being the average. Yep. Um, but the house will gain 84 square feet by the addition yep. of this area in front. Yep. Um, the yard itself is mostly landscaped, correct? Because the yeah. document says that there's only 398 square feet of landscaping. Darren? Yep. Yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me? Go ahead. Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. So, as far as the document, Bob, 398. Yeah. Feet of landscaping that that seems way off. There's there's a lot of landscaping in the yard. Are we talking just the front yard? So it would be that all the landscaped areas on, on the back and the sides. Um, yeah, that's the that's, one, that's the reason I bring this up, and I had hoped that it would have been corrected before. Is if you add 84 square feet, then all of a sudden it's no longer 10 percent of the lot area that's dedicated to landscaped area. But I, we can all tell by looking at the property that it's far more than that. Yeah, much um, greater than that. Much greater than that. In the in the yeah. area that we're we're talking about, you know, putting back, this was basically this platform has been here. This has been my family's home, and I'm not a yeah. developer here. This is my home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyways, we've owned the home since the '50s, and the platform's been there with a full porch with a full roof. That's why we shared some pictures that we were able to dig out, and we're looking yeah. to put the porch back the way it was, you know, including some windows to get some cover. Um, as far as the landscaping and all that, I can honestly say I didn't look deep into this because I didn't think it was super relevant to the platform being closed in. So I hired mm -hmm. the professionals and asked them to do their thing. And, you know, Bob put it together for us. Um, but yeah, there's the, it's all landscaped, the whole back, the side. Um, there's probably, if I had to guess square footage wise, uh, we got probably 30 on the sides by 80. That's probably 2,400. We probably have uh, 20 by 50 in the back. That's another 1,000. Then we have a, a shallower side on the left side that's probably 15 by 60. So, yeah, yeah there's a whole lot of landscaping. So something must be wrong with the uh, with the paperwork there. I apologize okay. for that. No, no problem. Um Scott Lynch revised so the it, other, but, but all right, go ahead. Um, the other question, so the other is the question of usable open space. Um, so is the, so the, on the, going down the right-hand side, there's the driveway, um, and then there's a couple of landscaped areas, and there's a couple of retaining walls going down. Past That's correct. That, past that second, the, past the third retaining wall, the last retaining wall. Is that is the rear yard basically flat back there, or is it still sloped? No, nope, it's absolutely flat. It's it's way <laughs> okay. less than the. I think oh. it's an eight percent. Yeah, and 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 I spoke with with Scott about that because Bob asked me to, and you know I tried mm -hmm. to straighten him out on that. That there's probably, uh, I would say that flat piece after that last retaining wall. I'm here right now looking out the window. That's probably that's probably. 40 by 30, maybe just guessing 40 by 30. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a big piece. Yeah. The, 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 the width at 26.8 is on the drawings, the length um, we don't have, but it's, I would imagine that it probably meets the requirements for um, having the, the proper percentage of usable open space. So I would just ask that I, We'll talk it over as a board, but that may what we may um, include as a condition just having the the drawing the information sheet be updated to be correct. Of um, course, the of the they have someone else do it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, 
So those were the only con concerns I had. I I like the the sketches you had provided. Um, you know, it certainly looks like it fits in with the house. Um, I had taken a brief look at the residential design guidelines. Um, and essentially this is a kind of thing that the design guidelines are looking for, sort of some small scale pieces that, you know, as the property moves closer to the to the front. Um, so these sort of small entryways, and as you said, it's in keeping with the, the way the neighborhood is set up and the other houses, the windows are similar to other windows on, on the house. Um, it looks like the siding is similar. So uh, for that perspective, I think that's all fine. Um, the only other thing I had, and it's just a, it has nothing to do with the application, but it would just sort of be a recommendation. Um, the, the two steps that are shown on the sketches leading up to the front door, that you might want the top step to be a lot deeper, just so it's safer when you're opening that door, so you're not potentially stepping backwards onto a lower step. Yeah, um, yeah. What's going to happen I, with that is that that concrete step's going to stay, and you know, if we okay. get to, to complete this, what happens is that's going to get built on top of with a composite style step that's going to come out and, and be code compliant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was my only concern was just that you know having that top step be be safe when you're you know if you're going through all this effort to make it better to come into your house it would be a shame if it, that top step wasn't safe so um yeah just, no, that's absolutely. More, yeah just something to consider um so with that i'm gonna go ahead and stop the share and see if there are questions and comments from the board Let's see any anybody Nope, with that, I will go ahead and open this hearing for public comment. Public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand. It should be addressed through the chair. Uh, that's the raise hand uh, button on the reactions tab, uh, if you would like to speak or just turn on your camera and wave. Last chance for public comment. Go ahead and close public comment for this hearing. Uh, so this is a an application for an enclosed entrance on the front of the building. Um, the, this would extend into the front yard setback, which the board is allowed to approve under 539B, um, or excuse me, 539A, 539A. Um, and um, the board, there are no special conditions, that, uh, special findings that the board needs to make. The board would just need to uh, do the standard seven uh, uh, findings for a special permit. Um, and uh, Mr. Nessie had read uh, what he had included in his uh, special permit application. Um, that uh, it can be approved by uh, 539A. Um, it's essentially desirable because the applicant would allow it to enter and exit the home in all weather conditions without um, firstly impacting himself with the entrance to the home. There would not be an increase in traffic congestion. There would not be an overload of municipal systems. Uh, there are no additional special regulations and uh, requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district because um, it's in keeping with the physical characteristics of other homes in the neighborhood. It would not be out of a place if the application were to be approved and the proposed addition of approved would be compatible with other homes in the neighborhood. Um, so those would be the findings. Uh, um, and then the uh, should the board decide to vote in favor of the application, we would have the three standard um, conditions that were previously read into the record. Um, and I would also want to add that the applicant is to provide revised uh, dimensional and parking information and open space gross floor area sheets correcting any deficiencies discussed at the hearing. Um, that I would want to include that, that as a fourth condition. Are there any questions in regards to the findings or the proposed conditions on this application? Seeing none, uh, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I move that the uh, board approve the application subject to the three standard conditions plus the additional condition involving providing revised documentation that the chair read into the record. Second. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. DuPont. So the vote of the board to approve the special permit for 77 Tanager Street with the four stated conditions. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hulley. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, that is approved. Thank you all very much on that. Thank you. Good night. You're very welcome. Good night. Um, that then moves us on to 3768, uh, 15 Moc Moccasin Path. Uh, first, let me just say to the applicant, I apologize it's gotten so late. I thank you so much for your patience. Um, and if you could uh, tell us your name and address and what you would like to do. So uh, my name is uh, Nolan from Savoy Nolan Architects. Uh, everybody can hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, I'm here uh, representing the owner of 15 Moccasin, um, Scott and Chelsea Buyer. Um, and I'll try to be brief given that it's late. Um, if, am, I, am I able to share my screen? Uh, Colleen, can you give Mr. Nolan sharing permission? You're all set. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so we'll thank you so much. Start with the uh, Uh, this is the existing site plan, um, the existing house, uh, the one and a half story um, uh, cape. Uh, and uh, so this is the existing site right here. There's an existing one car garage that we're looking to replace with a two car and uh, a master bedroom suite above it, uh, which is essentially the project. Uh, moving forward, uh, everybody can see the uh, graphics, correct? Yeah. yeah great. Yeah, uh, this is the proposed uh, site plan uh, that shows the addition. Uh, we're conforming in all the setback requirements. Um, uh, the reason why we're before you is because of the size of the addition um, per uh, section 5.4.2 B6, um, uh, an addition exceeding 750 square feet. Uh, so this is the addition in uh, in red there, and I'll just quickly go through um, uh, what's in your packet. So this is the existing basement. You can see uh, uh, largely unfinished. There's a workout room, and this is a partially finished basement with a um, uh, with laundry. Uh, this is the existing uh, first floor, kitchen, great room, uh, and then two smaller rooms over here and the single car garage, and then two bedrooms upstairs. So it's a pretty modest house. Uh, just some existing uh, pictures, additional cape with, uh, with an extension on the left-hand side facing the street. Apologize for my printer quality. <laughs> uh, now we'll get into the post. Uh, so we are looking to do a... Um, Going to fast forward to the first floor plan. That's where you can see the majority of it. So there is a, um, sorry, can't see the whole thing. Okay. Uh, so this is the existing house here. Uh, we're looking to uh, add uh, a little bit of room off of the back here and infill in between the garage and the, um, and the existing house um, with the guest office. Uh, this, this room exists currently. We're just enlarging it a little bit. Um, and and it's and it's mostly to um, create this new mudroom piece. So from the garage, uh, they, there's a transition into the house where there's they have some closets. That's really we're not really even enlarging the room. We're just kind of pushing it to the rear so we can get this mudroom in. Then uh, here's the new two car garage on the same side. Then on the upper levels, it turns into the uh, uh, primary bedroom. And you'll see that we achieve that with a dormer off of the back end, off of the front. Um, 
elevations. So this is the existing. Uh, I forgot to mention, sorry, to one other proposal that's uh, technically, I guess, not for you is the uh, front entry piece, which we'll be adding onto the house. Which I believe we can do by right. Um, this is the uh, proposed addition, garage off the side with the dormer, um, kind of match the existing shape style. Side profile showing the back, the rear uh, dormer, and the rear addition. This is the rear. This is the elevation that you don't see too much of the uh, addition on, uh, except for the front entry piece. and uh, a computer model image of what the addition will look like. Um, similar, it's clapboard style. I know it's a, image is a little grainy. Um, clapboard to match the existing, it's a white house, so we're gonna match the color. We have uh, black windows with um, uh, six over sixes, uh, and we're proposing to match that in the, um, in the existing, uh, I'm sorry, in the proposed. Um, Dormer is bigger than the uh, small little a dormers off the existing house uh, get space needed for the for the uh, master bedroom. Um, that's the extent of the, uh, the presentation. Um, I'm happy to field any questions. Great, thank you. Um, looking at this image itself, um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that the garage is staying back uh, away from the front of the building. Um, I think that, that helps to sort of keep the scale down and keep it back. Um, the driveway, I just want to make sure you're aware that the the town, the maximum width for driveway is 24 feet. So um, just making sure that you keep that in mind. Um, and then the only other thing is, so the dormer that you're proposing for the front of the addition, did you look at all into uh, extending the eave line across all the way across rather than breaking it for the dormer uh yeah we did um uh, we preferred this we like the aesthetic of this better okay I, I just asked because all the other dormers the eave is continuous and so this is the only dormer on the house where it's not continuous so i just wanted to make sure that that was something you had had considered deliberately yeah, we did. Um, if you'll notice, the existing dormers are actually set back um, from the um, uh, from the from the face from the you know, the exterior wall uh, where this one is flush with it. Um, so the small little roof here wouldn't actually quite relate to the proportions that are on the existing house. It's a different proportion altogether. So mimicry comes from the you know the the pitches and and the fact that it's a, an A dormer. But we did we did look at it actually we looked at it a couple of different ways. Um, this is the one that we arrived on as being the um, well one that Scott and Chelsea arrived at is is being the one that they'd like to go for. Got it. Um, the only other thing I would bring up is on the dimensional sheets. Um, the square footage is slightly different between the two sheets. Um, on one of them, the gross the existing house is listed as being uh, 3330, and the other is 3339. Um, and then just that difference carries through. Um, so on okay. the proposed is 4927 on one and 4944 on the other. Um, so if you just want to just make that correction, um, Going forward, that'd be fine. It is three thirty nine. Okay, so it's thirty three thirty nine, and then afterwards it's forty nine forty. Is that correct? I'm uh, sorry, forty nine forty four. Correct. Yeah. The uh, the worksheet's okay. correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, that was all I had. Are there other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. I, I just had one. I, I think I think that the you know the drawings look nice. The rendering you're showing looks great. It feels very appropriate for the neighborhood. Um I just had a question about the roof, the roof lines. It looks like from the elevations, the ridge line is 
almost aligned between the addition and the existing home. Um, but where those where those two things intersect, what uh, what's what's happening there? Um, do you have a little valley or a cricket or what? How how are you resolving that? Yeah, there's a little cricket that you that you can't see. Got it. Okay. Good catch. Um, nice. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I, I forgot. Yeah. It's late. <laughs> my bedtime so I, I forgot to mention that the um uh Bouvier's, um talked with their neighbors and yeah. uh we are in receipt of um four um letters of support or was submitted to Colleen, i believe um this afternoon and uh or or earlier um i were you in receipt of those so we have one letter that we had received previously um from their Fronos's. Uh, I, I sent them. Madison. I did send them as soon as I got home from work, but it's possible that Colleen had had left for the day or was out um, okay. by the time I got to them. So we do have those for you if you'd like them. Um, so but, the, that's that's three three or four in addition to the one that we we have on file. I can read you the addresses if that helps. Certainly. Uh, so uh, nineteen Moccasin Path, um, fourteen yeah. Moccasin Path. Uh, Another one from 19 and 18 Moccasin Path. Okay. Um, and I was and Scott, maybe uh, maybe you could explain it a little bit better than me. But I was under. Uh, Scott told me that they had a block party um, recently uh, where they were able to share it with quite a few of their neighbors, and um, there seemed to be um, um, uh, support throughout the yeah, uh, throughout I, the neighborhood. I would yeah, thanks, Bill. We actually had a happen to have a block party last weekend, and um, you know, as a result of the um, the ZBA notification to much of the neighborhood, there was there was a lot of awareness about what we were planning to do, and we were able to talk to a lot of neighbors and even show them pictures about what we were considering doing. And everyone, um, you know, for lack of a better word, was was very uh, appeased by the aesthetic of it and and sort of what we were going for, um, and that we were going to sort of keep the character of the house. Um, so that was all great conversation um, that just happened to take place a few days prior to this meeting. Great, thank you. Are there any other members of the board who wish to address this, have questions or comments? If not, I will go ahead and open the hearing for public comment. Uh, public comments taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the chair and help the board in the in its uh, deliberations and may do the raise hand feature under reactions or turn on your camera and wave. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I was trying to look at this property on, um, on Google Maps and also square that with what I saw in the street view. And I don't know, there must be some differentiation in the age of the picks. I'm wondering, uh, I, in one set of uh, street view picture, there were some significant trees in the front and side yards. And in another one I saw, there was no trees. And I'm wondering what the tree history is, if I could ask through you, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Um, if Mr. Boogie could. Yeah, I'll be happy Sorry. to answer that. Um, so Thank we you. bought we bought this house in the spring of 2021, and when we bought it, every tree that we bought it with is still standing. Um, to the to the to that end, uh, there was construction done on this property by the previous owners, and what trees they may or may not have taken down, I'm not exactly privy to. Um, but I think I know the pictures you're alluding to um, prior to that construction, when it was a yellow ranch without the expansion. Yes. Uh, yes. And and I think they're just outdated, considerably outdated at this point. Um, but those trees were have been long gone. I, I couldn't even tell you necessarily where they were in the, in the yard. OK, Mr. Chair, that's uh, that's helpful. Um, and I saw also you said all the trees are now standing. Is this uh, project going to be impacting the trees that are now standing? There is no impact <clears throat> to the there is no impact. I, again, I'm not an arborist, but there, my understanding is there's going to be no impact to any of the trees on our property. Um, okay. We we trimmed back one small section in order to give us access to um, to to get equipment in. Uh, those are on side trees between my own yard and my neighbors. But outside of that, um, we don't plan to touch any of the. 
Okay. All right. Oh, sure. That's uh, that's good news. It was hard to tell from those picks <laughs> about what trees were there and what was going to be taken, but you're saying no trees are really planned to be taken at this point. That's correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you. Those pictures uh, on Google Street View are from 2007. So they are considerably old. I, I should have um, known from the lack of resolution. Uh, <laughs> um, I tried to find a date, but I didn't find it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. And I, and I would just note that the, the applicant will have to file a tree plan um, as a part of the permitting process. So the there will be some review of uh, the existing trees on the property. And if there's a determination that some additional protection of measures are need to be taken, those should be noted by the uh, by the tree warden at that time. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, so what the board has before it, this is a special a request for special permit for a large addition under 542B6. Um, the board needs to make three findings in regards uh, to this large addition, um, in addition to the, uh, the seven standard uh, determinations that it needs to make. Um, the first is that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Um, as has been said several times, this is very much in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, this is a, an area with a lot of that sort of that two family, that excuse me, the two story uh, house as opposed to two and a half. So it's mostly one and a half to two stories. This is in keeping with that, keeps the nice horizontal plane um, and is very similar to the, to the houses around it. Um, board is to consider dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. Um, this is an extension towards um, the neighboring house at uh, 11 Moccasin Path, um, but it does not violate the, the setback conditions. Um, Correct. And it is you know, just, it is still maintaining that same height uh, that, that the house is today. Um, and consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. So the, I, I think that the, the addition here where it is making the house more usable for the uh, the existing owners and providing some additional space for them um, while minimizing the impact on uh, neighbors and the district is um, the, what the purpose of the bylaw would be. Um, and then for the um, for the standard seven conditions, uh, it's been put forward by the applicant. Um, that a single family residential is allowed in the R1, um, and that a large addition can be uh, can be approved by a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the requested use is essential or desirable to the public. Uh, it's an allowed use. We would continue as a single family rest, uh, residence keeping with the neighborhood. I would also note that it helps to modernize the house uh, by providing additional garage space and living space for the family. Um, Spending by the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or unduly impair pedestrian safety. Um, it is the same same use as before, same family, no additional uh, vehicles. Explain why the requested use will not overload public water drainage or sewer systems for, for the same reason it is still maintaining as a single family home. Uh, so be no impact on those. Describe how special regulations for use may be provided in the zoning bylaw. Um, as we noted, that is the uh, a large addition. Um, explain why the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district. Uh, we note that it is the same existing use as, and uh, from before and after, but also the same as the adjacent homes and consistent with the character of the district. And will not, by its addition to the neighborhood, cause an excess of the use that could be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood. Existing house, um, it's maintaining the the, the character of the neighborhood by maintaining uh, the single family residence. Uh, so those would be uh, my proposed findings for um, this application. Should the board decide to uh, vote in favor, uh, there would be the three standard conditions that we had read previously into the record this evening. Um, 
there's a very minor uh, typo in the form, so I don't think it's necessary to have the applicant go through uh, process of revising uh, the documentation because it is uh, it is correct on the one and it's just a typo on the other. Um, are there any additional conditions that the board would want to impose um, on the special permit grant? Yeah. No, uh, Mr. Hanlon? No. Um, okay, then with that, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the application be approved subject to the three standard conditions. Second. Thank, thank you, Mr. DuPont. There's a motion to approve the special permit for 15 moccasin path with the three conditions uh, before by Mr. Hanlon, seconded by Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, the special permit for 15 Marcus and Path is approved. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate you staying on this late. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. <laughs> Sorry to make it so late for you. <laughs> or stay up too late. <laughs> <laughs> all right well at, at mr hanlon's suggestion we've done everything else that we were going to do tonight already uh so all that we have left tonight is to thank everyone for their participation in the meeting of the arlington zoning board of appeals appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting I'd especially would like to thank uh colleen ralston and michael champa and michael cunningham for joining us uh and their assistance for preparing for and hosting this online meeting I would like to note that the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. And as our understanding, the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. A vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all so very much. We'll see everyone on October 24th. Night, guys. Good, Good night, night everybody. Take care, Good everyone. Good to see you Thank all. Thank you all. Good night.